Well, they rolled out this morning very, very cold. 11 Celsius. Not many, though, going for the full warming gear, as you can see. It wasn't that long. The pace was extremely high before we got ourselves a breakaway. A couple... Le départ fictif, dans 5 minutes, très bonne journée. Encore quelques minutes de patience. Bonjour, bonjour. Voilà, départ fictif dans moins de 5 minutes. Five stars, five warning markers, I think you might take it. And we are approaching one. Well, there's a couple in between. Next up, it is the Mange Montchaux, so Ekeon, and then it is Ouvelet to Valers. Yeah, we always forget that.
Come up, Mike. Go up. Look at the noise. Where's Bradley? Where's Bradley, Bradley? I see Wiggins. Go on, Bradley! Right at the back, Wiggins. Right at the back. Niet anders zitten nu, Richie. Ze moeten hier ergens zijn, normaal gezien. Ja, hier moeten ze zijn. Die politieauto. Daar zijn ze dan niet, daar in het draai? Nee. Ja, 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 ze zijn er. Ja, ze zijn er. Yeah, I'll pour l'espagnol tiré. Le vent, la poussière, voilà les deux premiers ingrédients de cette 112e édition de Paris-Roubaix. Paris-Roubaix, une fois encore, Laurent Jalabert, avec du soleil et de la poussière. Il y a bien longtemps qu'on n'a pas vu la pluie. Les coureurs ne vont pas s'en plaindre. Tant mieux, mais c'est vrai, ça n'était pas, ça fait bien longtemps qu'on n'a pas aperçu des gouttes d'eau sur Paris-Roubaix. Et je peux vous dire, puisque nous étions en reconnaissance avec notamment Jean-François Pécheux et Thierry Gouvenou lundi dernier, c'est une tradition avec ASO que de reconnaître le parcours, même si celui-ci change très peu. Il y a juste trois secteurs pavés qui sont légèrement modifiés par rapport à l'an dernier. Wow, look at this. Fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Hey
just amazing. de vous retrouver sur ce rendez-vous de légende. Je me trouve actuellement derrière les huit hommes de tête et parmi lesquels, vous l'avez dit, il y a trois coureurs français. Ces coureurs progressent régulièrement. Et comme vous le disiez tout à l'heure et comme vous pouvez l'apercevoir, cette 112e édition de Paris-Roubaix est placée sous le signe de la poussière. Beaucoup de poussière aujourd'hui, tout au long des 257 km et surtout un vent Messieurs qui soufflent de nord-ouest, un vent d'environ 30 km h qui va avoir un rôle très important dans, le, dans la partie finale, notamment au niveau tactique. Il va donc falloir être prudent et être et surtout évidemment épaulé de, de coéquipiers dans, le, dans la partie finale. Sur un horaire effectivement rapide, alors qu'ici un accrochage s'est produit, ça semble être en queue de peloton. Sans gravité, on redresse la mécanique et ça va repartir. Euh...
altijd uh, noord, noordwest. Nou, noordwest is moeilijk om wanneer te bepalen. In elk geval uh, schiet die wind hier bij ons onder het afdak van onze cities op de tribune. Uh, goed. Ik mag aannemen dat dat lekker koers weer is, maar dat gaat toch op bepaalde sectoren, op bepaalde stroken, uh, de renners, de vluchten te spelen. Men zal toch twee, drie keer moeten nadenken of voor eens een aanval te trekken. En Bonen hier in een achtervolging en uiteraard zitten ze daar pal op met de camera. Ja, op de kassei van Solem Aoussi. Opletten met die wagens natuurlijk. Als je in die achtergrond verzeild geraakt, zijn dat de problemen. Maar zit daar al in het zocht van de jurywagen, dan moet hij daar op de staart van het uh, peloton al in het vizier van... Duikt 11 seconden onder het parcoursrecord. 2.04.27. En jij was geïnteresseerd in Mo Farah. Hè? Ja. Debuteert met 2.08.21. Dan is uh, Kindenisa Bekeri er beter vanaf. Hier een uh, struikelpartij van een renner van Orika Greenwich. Er zijn er nog een paar op de cycle geraakt. Met de nummer 192 zien we daar Bries, VU en Demar onder man. Dat is een nerveus stukje hier voor Demar. Een nerveus intermezzo. Dat zal nog niet echt zin ik kan dat maar beter. And we're about to find out why. We certainly are. It's, of course, the queen of the classics. It's the one that all riders, of course, want to win. But it certainly isn't for everybody. There's a unique sort of rider that can only win this race. And it takes strength, knowledge, and, of course, a dash of luck, too. You have to know the pave. You have to know how to ride it. And there's not many riders who can do this sort of race and do any other sort of race. Increasingly over the last few years, it, it's a race for the specialists as they hit 
another section of Pavé now. Yes, this uh, is the, this. These are the leaders. They took a nasty turn into this section, as you can see. They are one full sector behind. So they are on. Uh, they're going from Kelenang to Famars as we speak. This is one of the most broken sectors. As you can see, there's not been much rain, and so dust is the issue today. Well, it would be if there wasn't a very, very stiff breeze, which is kind of hampering them as we speak. It is a crosswind, and so it's carrying the dust. You can see the clouds of it over to the left-hand side of your screen. So they're keeping them reasonably fresh today. You can see there are some bumps and scratches already, and plenty of uh, riders have already tasted punctures along the way. Arna de Mer, one of the quick men from Francis de Jure, has just been relayed back in to the pack. Out front, we have our brave breakaway riders, and they went off um, after about half an hour of skirmishing. Bradley Wiggins, incidentally, and Peter, Peter, uh, Sagan were at the back, just uh, resting, watching up, seeing what, how things were panning out. The trouble is, right now, there is no respite, and this is where the battle to be in the right place for the Arenberg begins. You saw them squeezing into the road, just trying to find uh, an exit from that funnel, that switchback, a few moments ago as they headed on this run to Fermaz, Sector 21. And they just will not fit, and so every single time you get onto the pave section, it stretches out, and ultimately it will snap. And when it snaps, that's when the breakaways, or indeed those with great ambition and talent, could go for it today. Definitely, there is a knack to, to riding the pave. As you could see, our breakaway eight riders were led at that particular time by the, uh, the red clad Lotto Bellisol rider of Kenny de Haas. He was riding right in the centre on the crown of the road as the chasing bunch are here, riding through a cloud of dust, making it very difficult to breathe and coating them in this fine sheen. Very, very difficult to breathe. I mean, you can see how difficult this particular sector is, but it's only a Category 2, so that doesn't augur particularly well for later in the race, but, of course, a lot of riders will know all these particular sectors. There are approximately two kilometres less pavé than last year. The course has changed a little bit, but they'll know these sectors very, very well. 28 sectors, of course, and uh, as then they'll be certainly counting these down as the day goes on. Uh, the Hell of the North it was coined as a phrase for the entire region. It wasn't really for the race itself, which is, of course, the queen of the classics, but it has been adopted as such due to the cobbles. This is where an awful lot of fighting went on in both world wars, and uh, in some areas, not a tree was standing. And you see the wide open fields remain. Uh, but it is a bare landscape and there's no hiding place. And that, I think, is the character of the race that we've got today. We are in this brief hi hiatus. We are waiting for this battle towards the tee up to the Arenberg to begin. And it's about to happen. Those who are up the road, let's do them the favour, shall we? David Boucher of Francis de Jure is in the break, which stands at two, 6 minutes and 23 gap at the moment. Kenny de Haas, as we've mentioned, from Lotto Bellasol, also there. Michael Collard from Tinkoff Saxo. We also have Breton Schuller with uh, Breton Sesh Environmental, I beg your pardon, this year. Um, they have Benoit Javier. They also have Clement uh, Koretsky, who's up there. He's been going well. Um, Schillinger from Team Neta Pendura has also made the break. Tim De Troya of Wanty Group Gobert and John Murphy, the American from United Healthcare, has found himself <laughs> maybe in a place of regret. We will see. There are the cobbles, and this, remember, is not even one of the five-star classifications. The first of that trio of absolute nightmare cobblestones is about to join us. It will be with 95.5 kilometres to go. In the meantime, the leaders still have got to deal with the Uvalui to Valas. That's a Category 4. And so no wonder they're taking some drink. Clear the dust out of their throats and breathe deeply. We'll take a breath. We'll be back in a moment. Welcome back. You join us as uh, the main peloton. Still very much together, but for how much longer, goodness only knows. Uh, there you go. It just shows you how you can get spat into a place you just do not want to be. If you're trying to find a bit of respite to the side of the cobbles here, where the rain gullies are, are, are kind of a flatter affair, mainly due to the fact that there's earth bleed, bled onto the uh, cobblestones, you can find yourself uh, suddenly halfway up a bank, as uh, we saw just a moment ago. I think that was uh, Lassie Norman Hansen that uh, took an excursion. 
nonetheless um, you can see that the drive is on and it is because they're trying to tee themselves up as we said for the Arenberg there's still one other sector for these guys to deal with along the way uh, you just look at uh, Erwan Corbel there from uh, Breton Schuller in the white jersey just over to one side of the road trying to as we said find uh, some smoother way look at the arms and the wrists and the shoulders they essentially are your shock absorbers uh, the front wheel takes most of the hit sets up a vibration through the frame of the bike and it seems that not as much goes through the saddle bizarrely the big hit is out front and has hence the uh, um, the bars generally there is some kind of cushioning underneath the tape so Roubaix bars generally tend to be a bit fatter some riders like it, some riders don't. Sean Kelly, famously, who's uh, not with us today, incidentally, on other duties, um, said that he never could do it because it gave him blisters. Just the change of grip was enough. Sensitive boy. You saw the chase down going on, and no surprise to see that Omega Farmer Quick Stop are up there. They very much thinking about Tom Bonin today. Tom Bonin, obviously, uh, looking to possibly make history today, but uh, he's got to certainly beat one other man who is the hot favourite. And that, of course, is Fabian Cancellara and obviously his Trek factory racing team at the moment opting to take the centre of the, this particular cobbled section, the crown of the cobbles. That section is normally a little bit higher and uh, not as worn as the, as the side sectors. But it, again, it is a definite skill. Some riders, as you can see here, picking the right-hand side. But uh, Tom Boonen hasn't been in great form. He's been, been going pretty well over the last few weeks but has had a few personal problems. But uh, again... The difficulty coming into this race for Tom Boonen is there is an immense amount of pressure on Amiga Farmer Quickstep. Patrick Lefebvre has been quite vocal in his uh, disappointment over the last few weeks. That's despite Amiga Farmer Quickstep as a team having approximately 20 wins already this season. But Patrick Lefebvre and, of course, Tom Boonen, they want a monument. They haven't won Flanders. They didn't win Milan San Remo. They want to win Paris-Roubaix. Well, can they? They've got an amazing team. On paper, they are the strongest. As you look at our breakaway riders, still relaying nicely, incidentally. They're on a smoother section, a little bit of respite. Next sector up for them, incidentally. Sector 19, over Louis to Vallas. And then, of course, it is the run to 95-kilometre mark to the Arenberg, the big trench. And, in fact, plenty of trenches and that kind of warfare, for sure, cycling-wise. Let's speak to Tom Bonin. Um, last week, from the game to the game on, I was really improving. Uh, to the Flander, I was, uh, I was, I think, very good till 2.30 k's. The last half hour, I was uh, out on the limit, just physically on the limit. So I think now, uh, with another week in the legs, with the first final of six hours last week, um, I felt okay on the cobblestones Friday. I felt pretty good, really good, actually, on the cobblestones. So I hope now that uh, I will make it until the, the finish line. And uh, it's all a little bit on the limit. I don't really have anything uh, to really look at and say, okay, I'm ready for this race. But um, I did the maximum possible, so it's up to. Uh, it's not up to me anymore. I just take the start and uh, do my best. Antonio, one question to the the core man of this day, of this uh, race. Well, he's the legend of Roubaix so far. So I just want to ask him about the next generation, new kids that are coming up. And personally, I think that guys like you, Fabian, even people will be dominating tomorrow. Do you agree with that, or you will be surprised with young kids coming? Oh, I think it's actually the first year I really see some other guys coming. Last year that was already Seb van Marke, um, but he uh, he will be he's one of the guys that will already be there for the next few years. There's a few other guys. They're not really the young kids anymore, but it's they need a little bit more time to grow into this role. Van Avermaet is good on the cobblestones, and uh, for sure there will be many others. And uh, it's the first time for Sagan. Also something we have to look at, and uh, I will be uh, looking with very big eyes to what he is able to do here. Perfect. Regarding you, uh, are you conscious that uh, it's perhaps the eve of uh, of the absolute record? Yeah, but uh, it's, like I already said, it's something. At this point, winning a fifth Paris Roubaix would be something that put my career into yeah, another light. But it's not something that uh, it's my ultimate goal for the moment. It's the one thing that keeps me going. But uh, it won't change the world. Eh? It, it, it's an extra win, and but it's one extra win that really counts. Uh, it really does count, and if you've uh, got five fingers on one hand, that's exactly how many wins Tom Bonin will have achieved should he be victorious today. He's level on victories with Roger de Vlamic. Uh, Roger himself missed the Paris-Roubaix from 69 to 82, and his list was absolutely outstanding. Fifth, second, seventh, first, seventh, two wins, 
a third, a first, once more, two seconds, uh, then a DNF, rarely for him, a second and a sixth, just to finish him off and almost finish off the statisticians. This race as well will pull out many today, and you've got to pull out all the stops if you want to be there. Frek van Avermet is one of uh, the neo-favourites. I say neo-favourites, there, there is a real pecking order here. Right at the top is Fabian Cancellara, let there be no doubt about that. And then there's this second drawer, if you like, with Seth van Mark, who's been beaten yet again, just recently in Flanders, by Fabian Cancellara, the very man. He came into the velodrome last year with what a heartbreak that was for Seth van Mark. His disappointment, he couldn't even look at Cancellara when they stood on the podium in Flanders, where he finished third, don't forget, uh, this time by, just last week. Amazing. Can he do it this time? Will it be Tom Bonham for the record? Set Van Mark is riding extremely strongly. We saw last week that uh, Set Van Mark was the only rider that was able to follow uh, the acceleration of uh, Fabian Cancellara on the old Quermont, of course, where he dis distanced his rivals. Obviously, we already had this rider here, Greg Van Ivermeer, who was second in Flanders, fourth last year, of course, in Paris-Roubaix, Boot Roubaix, been paced back on by his teammate Manuel Quinziato. But uh, Set Van Mark, one of the hot favourites for this race, and arguably uh, on his day is uh, is one of the only runs who can actually stay with the, with the ferocious accelerations of, uh, of Fabian Cancellara. Definitely the big tip. Uh, and you see the green men mustering themselves. That is partly Cannondale working for Peter Sagan, who can never be counted out. They won the E3, don't forget, but he's had too many second places for his own liking and really is very determined. His uh, main domestique is Masish Bodnar from Cannondale. But uh, watch out for the green. The green, perhaps, of Belkin and Set Van Mark. BMC, we saw Greg Van Avermet, li likewise one of uh, the uh, other favourites along the way. Don't count Ale Alexander Kristoff from King Team Katusha. And you see Katusha as well keeping themselves very much towards the fore and the reason is that we are heading for this battle zone royal coming up the breakaway riders are just about to get into a four-star sector it's quite long as well so sector 19 on the countdown if you like of the 28 Uvaloy to Valas and that is going to be a place that everybody needs to be where they should be and just as he was coming back uh, Van Avermet gets trapped behind yet another stack we've had some of these already today and thankfully it's street furniture that's got in the way nobody had warned them about the barrels there wasn't a pennant man there unless he's just leapt out of the way this is the nightmare that you can get and this is in a crucial time it certainly is. There's a very, very difficult section of Pave coming up. But riders, as we've seen so, in so many times over the last three weeks in these Cobble Classics, do take to the, the footpath on numerous occasions. But uh, under, underneath this particular bridge, there is this awful bit of uh, fencing there that seemingly the rides have uh, collided into. Bit of a pinch point as well. Always these, these hazards and dangers along the route. Dicky Sorensen it was the last man to pick himself up. Uh, Marco Kump, I think, is there to help out. But uh, this is the sort of thing. You need luck to do well here. We're looking at uh, Alexander Kristoff, who we were just talking moments ago about uh, uh, Team Katusha and just ha what a star turn he is already and potentially is for this race. Troubles, though, you've got to avoid them. Definitely was there with Dominic Clem of I Am Cycling for company. Hopefully, he's a rower. He's a rider of a lot of experience. And again, we can see here, look at that little pinch point there. Riders oh. taking to the footpath. They're at sixes and sevens. There's so much stress going on in the bunch. They know the sectors. I've seen Tom Boonen's bike. He's, he knows this race like the back of his hand, but he's got the sectors and the kilometrage on his stem on a piece of tape. He needs to know where they are. But there's such a panic to move up. Obviously, uh, Trek Factory Racing sets in a really high pace at the front. But all there's going to be in the ears of these riders on their radios is get to the front, get to the front. There's an immense amount of pressure and stress. And, of course, they've got to keep focus too. Very, very difficult indeed. Here's the result. Um, thank luckily, it's quite a mix of teams as they were wrestling for positions when we had the fall it was on one side of the road and as a result there are many of their teammates up the road and not bound to attack at the moment so it's a good mix and lucky for them it is it certainly is that there might be a bit of waiting again if trek or if amiga farmer quickstep have lost any guys they might actually back off a little bit to let some uh, let some riders uh, come back in and as you can see there there is i wouldn't call it exactly a truce but there is a slightly uh, the pace has dropped off slightly so that a lot of the team leaders can get back one of the key rods of course caught up whilst chasing to get back on was Greg Van Avermaet. He didn't look like he was injured at all, looked like he got more tangled up than anything else, as we see one of the various street parties along the route today, because this is, this is a, as well as an event, it's a
festival as well. People come out in their droves to savour this uh, to savour this particular event. It's uh, it's part it's steeped in culture. This bit it's it, absolutely amazing. It certainly is. The the big models, by the way, they are um, uh, the friendly giants, which exist um, basically to help you chastise your children. Uh, do you want the friendly giants who are not going to be terribly friendly if you don't behave yourself? Uh, yes, they are the protectors, if you like. And you often see them walking around here. It is a, uh, a wooden frame with canvas and then painted up. Um, there we are. <laughs> 104.3 kilometres to go, just part of the Atmos that is here. Um, in 200 metres, they're going to be on the uh, penultimate power bay before the Arenberg. Plenty more still to come. So this is 19 as we count down that they are approaching. Sector 19. It's category four, so not the absolute highest, but at two and a half kilometres in length, it's approaching one of the longest. Definitely, it's, it's one of the longest on the race. And as you can see, there's a desperate chase here from, it uh, looks like Francais Lejeune, it looks like Armand Demar, their team leader, has possibly been caught in that uh, crash. But several, well, 20 or 30 riders on the back. There's a number 87 here from a Garmin taking service. Well, David Miller, of course, riding in his last season. And if you can just look very, very closely, unless he's got overshoes on, he'll have a pair of special physics sh uh, shoes, which are going to be auctioned off at the end of the year, denoting every single race that he races in. It'll be interesting to see what design is on those shoes. But David Miller, of course, a very, very experienced campaigner, and it came to the Classics very late, of course. Uh, we just saw Bo Bozic uh, doing a great job of uh, getting himself into a very safe position after most of his teammates were cast asunder by that incident. So Bozic is looking very good. Probably principal rider, of course, for Astana. We'll see how they go. So sector 19, they are approaching right now. And oh, goodness me, ride your luck. That's again. He's riding into trouble at the moment. Well, it's come at a bad time, as we said. Now, this may well draw a response from those up front who fear this man, and they, they fear him for good reason. Peter Sagan, one of the most talented riders in the peloton, a very, very untimely punch it, and it looks like a quite a tangled wheel change as well. But he's getting back, his teammates are waiting for him. I wouldn't have thought uh, that anybody would press on any more, but what they're certainly not going to do is wait for a rider of the calibre of Peter Sagan. But he's back in the convoy straight away. He's a man of immense talent. I'm sure he'll be back at the back of the, uh, the peloton as soon as possible. Struggling to find gears, struggling, struggling, as you see. Um, he'll, uh, is it... <laughs> Still, in fact, uh, not overly pleased. I don't know what the tangle was, but um, he's racing on at the moment. And, uh, well, he's in decent company. Um, you want a good domestic if you possibly can get one. And uh, right now he's got Alan uh, Marignoni along with him, who's doing a, a super job for him. But he still doesn't look happy on the bike. It's a question of getting your mind back together as well after a moment like that. The thing is, you know that this thing, that this is the sort of race where pu where punctures and accidents do happen. So I don't think he'll be panicking. He shouldn't panic. He just needs to sit on the wheel and get back in. We'll take a break, but we will be back with some of your questions and thoughts after this. He's still not happy with their gears. Okay, and we're back doing. Maar goed, het is beslissen in een fractie van een seconde. Hè. Je ziet hem uh, een probleem hebben en dan wil je zo snel mogelijk helpen. Je bent daarvoor aangeworven. Op een kleine 100 kilometer van de aankomst. De trooier gaat daar heel vlotjes naartoe, ook al omdat Koretsky zich inhoudt. Maar toch, de trooier rijdt goed over die kasseiruggen.
Wat me ook al opviel in de eerste etappe in de Panakokseide, dat hij een hele mooie stijl heeft. Die op. Welcome back, Peter Sagan. <laughs> well, he was being relayed before he just decided to leave his teammates behind. For goodness sake, you're not going quick enough, he said, and uh, takes a short route round the roundabout. I'll just do this myself. Try and stay in touch. Try and stay alert, boys. He called for the cavalry late on in Flanders. They were too late to him, uh, blew themselves out, and in the end, he just ran out of energy. Can he do more on this flatter, of course, almost pan flat, but, uh, of course, the cobbles to deal with. Parkour that we're have here at the Paris-Roubaix and find his teammates sort of pick up the ante and, and go for it. Uh, we're still speculating as to what the problem was with Peter Sagan's uh, wheels. He was pulling tape off. Now, you have a look at the handlebars here and you'll see just how fat they look. There is padding underneath, like a little bit of sponge padding. synthetic sponge padding and you need it there to uh, just take some of the impact some of them do anyway um, meanwhile we'll get back to that in a moment because this is the race on to Uvaloy to Vallas this is sector 19 that the main chasing peloton are about to engage in and uh, already further down the line are our six escapers and this is crucial that he's in a decent place for this because as you get into the Arenberg we can already see tactics starting to be laid out before us the race isn't normally a one in Arenberg, but it's certainly a, a place that the race can be lost. And Peter Sagan, as we see Bernie Eisel from Team Sky, oh. leading the bunch around the corner. And one of the Amiga Farmer quick step riders taking that a little bit wide and nearly coming to grief. But Bernie Eisel riding, looking after his uh, Team Sky teammates. Obviously, Ed Vald, Bose and Hagen for this particular race in Team Sky is the out and out leader. But what a team. Well, we can see Bradley Wiggins, Geraint Thomas all at the front at the moment. Luke Groh, another rider, the well right on the right hand side so team sky in a very very good position and gabriel rashford the norwegian riding one of his last ever races he'll soon be a direct sportif of team sky taking to the middle of the road which is the best place to be team sky at the moment ideally placed yep they're on the overloy and just look at the dust storm that they're kicking up on this dry day on the paris roubaix uh, the difficulty is actually breathing and how much of this stuff you actually ingest swallow absolutely your mouth is full of spittle and if you don't uh, put some water in there and spit it back out out, then it's all going into your tummy and it's not a nice thing at all we've seen riders throwing up and it's not just because of the um, uh, the, the exertion it's right. it's what they've been taking down which is just not nice you can see the riders and some of the team cars actually caked in this dust the ride is difficult to see I think the visibility now it's like a bit of a pea super out there this mist hanging in the air and of course these riders on each section of pave are going to be riding nearly full bore as we see a couple of the Trek riders sorry a couple of the Shimano riders are looking like they're punctured there but uh, you can see the devastation rides are dropping off the back in ones and twos at the moment well it was John Dagenkolb who was desperate to try and get into position I believe anyway from team giant Shimano who went wide on the run
Two and a half kilometers. Now the Arenberg beckons. It's not as long, but it is so almost twice as brutal, you might think. We'll be heading into the woodland and cannot wait for that. We have three, five category, five stars or five devils tridents, I think you might say. The Mont de Pevel is also coming and the Carrefour de, de Labre as well. Looking forward to that. Uh, so three nightmare sections and one will be with the breakaway riders in just about uh, two and a half kilometers time. So as we approach it, we might just have a uh, picture in picture of uh, one of our uh, guest stars talking about what lays ahead. One thing is for absolutely uh, certain here is that they're can, you, you never know how your luck is going to pan out. We've just seen that with Sagan. Everyone gets their bad luck. It's when you get it. It is, of course, the cobbles they're going to... Hey! heading for soon the forest of Arenberg or the Trou Trouille de Arenberg as it's uh, sometimes known and all that also the Tranchy de Arenberg is absolutely legendary introduced into this Paru Bay for the first time in 1968 uh, John Sublingsley the former world road race champion and multiple French uh, road race champion was set on an exploration to find some of the worst pavé in northern France and that's what he found but the ironic thing is when he was 19 years of age he was a young miner in the mines directly underneath the forest of Arenberg and in 1968 rode it, the only rider to actually go underneath it and on top of it. Absolutely legendary stuff. It's going to hit these riders very, very soon. 97.4 kilometres to go. Over five minutes remains the gap. The average speed has, of course, tumbled. Uh, however, it's still for the entire race. <laughs>
it's uh, Francesco Moza and of course Fabian Cancellara. He wants victory so he can join that elite group. Bonham wants victory so he can stand alone. He's on four victories at the moment with Roger de Vlamic. Can he make it five today? Will somebody else upset the apple cart and nick it? We'll be talking about the favourites. There's your mind of your man. Uh, downstairs, upstairs, downstairs, I think uh, you could have said about him. Oh, he's remembered. So are we. And indeed, uh, so will this race be. Every year we write history. It's been like this since 1896, for goodness sake. The Arenberg is a big part of the heart of it. Let's find out about it, shall we? It, it's quite a surprise for you to to participate to Paris this year. How do you feel? Did you did you have a good preparation? Uh, yeah, it was a surprise, but I already had in my back of my mind that I was the first reserve. <laughs> <laughs> crashes in uh, the Tour of Flanders and uh, yeah it's not good for uh, Stein but uh, I'm, for me it's good uh, I'm happy so uh, yeah I can do uh, my best for uh, Fabian and uh, it's a dream for everybody to be in this team I think. Um, well, I have a tactical question for you. Well I, I want to ask you uh, basically your role you did a You helped me crucial moments in this race last year. Is it going to be kind of similar role trying to help Fabian probably like before, uh, well after the Arenberg Forest or you're going to do more help him in the beginning of the race? Um, yeah, actually I, we didn't talk uh, that much about it because I just arrived here. And uh, But I think, uh, I guess it will be the same role like uh, last year for you. I will keep uh, Fabian in a good position and uh, hopefully I can I can do my job very well. Yeah. <laughs> you do like last year, it will be great. Ah, thanks. Clément Koretsky, on a l'America Murphy. Uh, not quite the preview that we were hoping for. We'll give you one ourselves in just a moment. Just to let you know, incidentally, uh, David Boucher of uh, Francis Seger has just punctured out of the break. And the breakaway riders are just heading in to the Arenberg. And so the chasers will be here in just under five minutes' time. Um, that seems it's a legendary part of this race. It's the first of the three major tests, of which there are many sub-tests, of course, but only three categorised climbs. We're about to hit one. It's massive. Yeah, Carlton, the, the forest of Arenberg uh, doesn't need too much of an explanation. Obviously, this, this lead group now hitting it, but it, it is absolutely... at all 
the best way to ride obviously the barriers at the side do not let the riders ride to the side on that little track they had they are forced to ride on the cobbles the best place to ride although it is the bumpiest is the center on the crown of the road but very very difficult should you come to grief because these can actually tear your legs to pieces if you fall off and obviously tear the bikes to pieces it's vital that they hit them as hard as they can and essentially float over them yep uh, the crown of the road may well be rough but you've got alternatives so uh, you could drift out and maybe avoid a crash but you can't avoid it seems punctures along the way incidentally they're running extraordinarily fat tires here uh, it's one for the chubby boy if he was on the road such as myself uh, but uh, what are we 28s 29s even bigger well most teams are running 28 so I know that Amiga Farmer Quickstep are using 30 millimeter wow. tires at the rear so the actual clearance on the brakes is, 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 is hardly anything at all it's a fag paper clearance on the rear brake 28 on the front running 65 psi in the rear 55 psi on the front Thick and fast, the punches are coming. That's Kenny De Haas, who's just dismounted as well. Uh, this is going to be a nightmare if you are in the main pack and you're trapped behind riders who are dismounting because of their mechanical troubles. There's not much room, not much space to go. And just look at the, even the television camera, which has steady cam technology on board, don't forget, is juddering. Imagine what the eyeballs of these riders are doing inside their own sockets. These cobbles are so ununiformed at all. These guys are they're professional riders. They know what the cobbles are like, but these are utterly unique and are completely and utterly bone jarring but Andreas Schiller the German from team net app Endura, is actually distancing his compatriots at the moment you cannot you just have to ride these cobbles at your own speed and look at the job he's doing sat on the tops weight evenly distributed but sat a little bit further back on the saddle powering as big a gear as you can and just riding this section at maximum speed and they're just waiting for the asphalt to come they're praying for the asphalt to come but they've just got to keep going they have to keep going at two 2.4 kilometers of sheer hell as you can see just look at the arms and the loose biceps here just being shaken around their forearms it's uh, really not a nice place to be at all so why do they keep coming back because it's absolutely magnificent that's why and if you look at the cobbles they were designed for cart horses to get grip for goodness sake pulling heavy loads and uh, gun carriages in Napoleonic Wars times that's when they were laid down every single one of these stones cut by hard labor convicts don't forget millions of them oh my goodness they're gonna feel like they've tasted everyone today absolutely incredible these cobbles weigh approximately 16 kilograms each have been there for years hardly any traffic at all passes over these cobbles to wear them down there's no smoothing of these cobbled they're jagged they're angular they're sticking out they're proud and every single bone in uh, these riders bodies is going to be pounded and jarred to the max. Well, Sean Kelly said that after doing Paris Roubaix, it takes you about a week, a week to go to the loo in comfort. Such is the battering that you've had on the old undercarriage. And he said it's even worse with the elbows, the wrists, and the hands. You better make yourself as comfortable as possible at home because uh, you, you need to do some for these guys out here who run the biggest amount of discomfort on a bicycle. Definitely will. Uh, Mokul Kolar from Tinkoff and Kenny De Hayes have been distanced. And it's the under the, the power actually of Andreas Schillinger absolutely powering over the most difficult section of Pave in this race, inspired by a tre tremendous crowd as the peloton approach the forest of oh, Arenberg. Oh, and look at the massing at the front. They are desperate to get on there first. They don't want to get caught behind uh, lads who get punctures or indeed go down with an incident. And this is. <laughs>
much at home on these cobbles. Ninth in the Tour of Flanders, fourth in Paris-Roubaix in 2007, and he really is taking it to them at the moment. He certainly is. Orica Greenwich, we have mentioned them. Jens Kerkelea is their skyrocket today. Can he possibly deliver? Of course, they've got Matt Haven, they've got uh, Luke Durbage. Uh, we have uh, Mike Hepburn, Mitch Docker, Sam Bewley as well, the key... <laughs> who's massively useful in this sort of situation and Jens Maurice they've got a great team uh, the Aussie outfit but they may well just fall onto the shoulders of their Belgian Jens Kerkeler today I think he may well go very well looks like the, the, the Russian national road race champion from team Katusha Vladimir Ichayev doesn't like it he's sat tailgun Charlie at the moment but there's several team sky rods at the front it's still one to group Guber it does look like Leukerman's at the front but I can also see very close to the head of affairs. Bernie Eisel is also there, but it's staying together. <laughs> in the uh, Netat Endura team. Sam Bennett for one has opted for those extra brakes for extra control and of course double bar tape or gel underneath those bars just to absorb the cobbles. And that's what they're having to do at the moment. John Dagerkov, winner of the Gent Webergram. There he is in the white with the uh, two white, the black stripes down his belly. The Russian champion's trying his level best to get on. Oh my goodness and Alex Dows it looks like he's been bitten certainly does it uh, Alex Dowse is struggling over this cobbles but what an experience it is for the young uh, British time trial champion but as we head to the head of affairs here you can see Stybar taking uh, the left hand side obviously the oh, world cyclocross champion plenty of it as well looks like uh, Jan Barter there it is the Czech champion has uh, found himself in the gutter for Netap Endura and that's the sort of thing you don't want to get caught up behind and look how strung out they are we said this was going to be war it's the first of three world wars that we're going to be having today it definitely is but the bunch there doesn't seem to be too many gaps in the bunch of the, as we look
is here and he was uh, third in West Flanders and can go extremely well on this sort of terrain. I think it looks like saint Shell, actually, the Frenchman uh, who uh, is powering away, but we will get a check on that for you. Uh, 90.5 kilometres remaining. It doesn't sound like much, does it? But it's going to take a long time for us to reach the velodrome in Roubaix. It certainly is. He's actually powering ahead here, but look at the gap. Look at the amount of time this flying peloton have eaten into the leaders. It's the gap now of four minutes ten as one of the radio shack with one of the trek riders throws his bike into the hedge in, dis in disgust but looks like all the main contenders as they exit the hell that was the forest of Arenberg and they swing left onto the asphalt and Brie a, in a collective sigh of relief that's one of the worst sections out of the way there it is five star uh, Arenberg has been dealt with save for those who are remaindered and one unfortunately for him it's Alexander Krisov now tactics are going to start to play to the fore will the attacks come early will they start sending satellite riders up the road who is going to do the damage which teams are going to be brave who's got the manpower left and who's got the will to take this on with still just shy of 90 kilometers to go yeah that's not the place that uh, alexander christoph wants to be absolutely flying in flanders and took an absolute stupendous win in milan san remo most of the main group are now on the main road but christoph is fighting for place he's trying to move up the best he can this is going to take a lot out of him and of course he was one of the favorites for this race but there's still a chance he could get back in there might be a bit of a general easing for the main protagonists to look at each other and see who's there yeah exactly who's there are we all together uh, who have we lost that was the mood out there tom leeser from belkin is uh, part of a drive train uh, that's hopefully going to deliver for set van Mar. <laughs> Looking for that is firstly perhaps to beat Fabian Cancellara at long last and maybe maybe just deliver when we get to the velodrome. He is one of the out and out favourites, Set Van Mark. He's absolutely on the best of form. Last year he was 150 to 1 after his performance then, and indeed so far this season he is amongst the very, very top draw. We'll take a break. We said this might be about tactics, and so it is proving. Uh, there have been a number of hopefuls who've decided to go off the nose of the main pack, and some pretty handy riders have gone up to join them and kind of stare them down, if you like. Um, and I think they all realise that it's very difficult to get a breakaway. Ilio Kaiser was sent. We said he'd be a bit of a torpedo today on uh, a, a lot of hope, and uh, so it will prove to be. Incidentally, next up is Sector 17 uh, on our countdown, and um, it's uh, a little bit of respite. Vallas to Helsemons, and then Sector 16, which is the Horneng to uh, Van Digny. Uh, that is a categorised four, so that's going to hurt. Incidentally, Christoph got himself a puncture. He's relaying back on, but he unfortunately is over a minute down on the secondary group which has uh, also split uh, TGV's getting in the way looks like they may well raise the barriers just in time not to hamper anyone too much of course uh, while, while we're looking at the, the crossing uh, situation there if you can cast your mind back a few years ago three three riders, riders were actually uh, disqualified uh, for going under the uh, the, the barrier I think you can remember I'm trying to think of who uh, who it was but uh, yeah that is a bit of a problem it looks like they're going to time it just right to get underneath uh, the, the particular barrier I think one of the riders w was Leif Hoster they finished in the top 10 and they were actually disqualified for actually going under the uh, the, the crossing oh and uh, there we go there you are that's exactly the crossing what has come down. Happen. there's no more trains and the the red light is still shining so it might be a regional train coming through there it is uh, granny's on board uh, busy at the moment Oh, he doesn't like it. Zero. That's about the politest thing he could possibly have said then. That's uh, David Boucher as well. Uh, he got himself a puncture, don't forget, as part of the break. Oh, we've got a crash. And we've got a man down here. And it's uh, from a Europe car in the road right now. Oh, goodness me, guys. And a Belkin rider as well. And uh, the, the man from uh, Europe car does not look happy. Is it Antoine Duchesne? We'll get a look at him in a moment's time. A little bit of a tangle with uh, one of the riders from Belkin. And on a turn in the cobbles, how cruel is that a place to be? 
It's a, it, again, a lot, a lot of these cobbled sections, especially uh, later on in the race, aren't just straight, Carlton. They've got some very, very sharp angled corners. And when you're cornering at speed on cobbles, uh, you know, especially some of the slight cambers that there are with this dust, although it's not wet, I'm sure the riders prefer these sorts of conditions, but that dust on the top makes the bike skip. Very, very difficult to lose it, especially when you're tired. You've just come off the Forest of Arenberg. Your legs are absolutely screaming. And then you've also got to think about controlling the bike when the bike is absolutely flying everywhere, despite the fact there is reduced tyre pressure, despite the fact uh, some uh, riders are opting for more that the, uh, the uh, cyclocross style forks. on their Colnago frames are opting for, but David Boucher shaking his head. Oh. And zero, he said. Uh, that wasn't A-OK, -okay, believe me. Uh, Bjorn Turo is from Europe Car, who's just uh, still staggering about a bit. He looks uh, dazed, but uh, apart from that reason, shake out there's going to be plenty more now um, just who is going as it gets more and more aggressive it's almost like a progressive crank up of the animosity here uh, teams start looking around and start blaming each other for not doing enough uh, work they, they they're thinking about their own tactics who to send up the road who to amalgamate with who's going to be the diesel engine to drive them on home and you can see now they're all having a bit of a chit chat yeah, that's uh, Hayden Ralston on the front there. His, uh, his strip, he's uh, obviously the New Zealand road race champion. You can just see the slight difference in his kit, than, although it's only a very subtle difference in his Trek teammates. But there does appear to be a little bit of a general accord here. But uh, as Tom Boonen famously said, a lot of the winning moves in Paris-Roubaix previously have gone on the asphalt sections of the road in between the horrendous pave sections. And as you can see, some of the groups just chasing on exploiting that there is a, a little bit of a general backing off of the tempo in the main group and that's going to allow some of these riders including Christoph to get back on again but Christoph did lose a minute and that unfortunately time puncture that just shows this is a race about physical ability it's about knowledge but it's about luck and unfortunately for Christoph there he's going to have wasted a lot of energy getting back into the bunch but General backing off here, allowing riders to take some GLs. I saw Matteo Trentown, the Italian, riding on the Amiga Farmer Quick Stick team there, taking a bit of a glance around, taking a bit of a breather. But as we're talking about the trains, it was actually the 104th Paris-Roubaix about eight, uh, eight years ago, where Leif Host, Vladimir Gusev and Peter Van Pettigen were disqualified for going under the level crossing. They actually got all finished inside the top ten, but were later disqualified. So uh, that's why uh, you don't go underneath the level crossings if they're down, because you do uh, risk being DQ'd. Uh, I'm afraid so. You can actually risk an awful lot more as well. Our own Johnny Woodall, who uh, used to be a commentator, uh, did liked a bit of cycling. In fact, he was on his bicycle when he was hit by a train and sadly killed a few years ago. So it's very close at home, that sort of thing. Uh, he was trying to beat the barriers, incidentally, so uh, that's a shame. 82.7 kilometres, uh, 4 minutes and 5 seconds is the gap as they race. And you can see on the side of the road, uh, just trying to find a, uh, a, a bit of a way through, a, a, a free pass, if you like. Well, if you do start using the pavings and if you do start also using cycle paths, uh, you can get yourself into all kinds of trouble. There is a move to ban the use of cycle paths uh, by uh, uh, cyclists when the roads have been closed, basically because it's where the public stand. And uh, we had a, an incident where there was a collision, just to keep the uh, sad stories going just for a moment, um, with uh, an elderly lady during the Tour of Flanders who's ended up as critical in hospital. Uh, due to a collision with a cyclist. Oh, and uh, they're hitting the deck, and this is a big one. We've been waiting for it. Giant Shimano, again, are the team who have... Oh, look at that! One man down, right off the front. We were talking about the side of the road, and that took Karen Jalara down. It was uh, Hayden Rolston who actually uh, tried to jump onto the, the footpath exactly as you were, at the same time as you were talking about it, taking down his team leader, Fabian Cancellara, who looks unhurt at the moment. 
looks a little bit more cheesed off than anything else, but that just shows you can take your eye off the ball for any moment, and he just tried to bite, he was on the pavement at that time, tried to hop off, lost it, the front wheel went away, and look at the devastation that's caused behind, completely blocking the road, and this was at the point in the race where there wasn't actually that much going on, absolutely, well, just amazing, but uh, it just shows the risks that there are in going onto the pavement. Uh, he Carson. was thinking about jumping on the pavement and then thought better of it because there were other riders coming uh to blame I suppose those who are already on the paving and uh, of course he that was going to go for it but unfortunately he brought down his team principal and red hot favorite for this race Ralston on the deck Cancellara on him he's certainly not going to live that one down in a long time that's going to be replayed over and over again uh, I hope they do get up I hope nobody's badly injured in that one that just shows you need to be paying attention and it just shows you, you can't just uh, casually leap, leap off the uh, off the off the footpath and, and expect to be okay but uh, look at the bunch now it's absolutely strung out and it looks like a meager farmer quick stick are taking advantage of that situation by piling on a little bit of pressure at the front but there he is number one Spartacus himself safely back in the group but he's going to be a little bit cheesed off at that and I see a couple of wheels behind it's Geraint Thomas of Team Sky and um, when they're this strung out that can be all of 800 meters to the front of what is a very stretched out Peloton at the moment now is are they minded to attack I think there were so many other riders who were down there that it might well be a difficult uh, job to do because so many had to remount and in fact it looks like a hiatus to let everyone get back on yet again there's only going to be so many of these get out of jail cards that are handed out by the Peloton definitely it did look like a mega farmer quick step in the form of William van Kielsburg who actually upped the tempo a little bit but they have backed off now to the Shah on the front there the Swiss national road race champion for BMC you can also see Taylor Finney in there and Greg van Arthema one of my tips if you don't mind me saying for victory today of course sir uh, was up there last year and rode extremely well to second place in Flanders but the BMC riders riding to the fore but that happened at the front you always say about riding near the front of the bunch because that's the safest place to be on that occasion it was the front it wasn't. man it wasn't <laughs> Ja, wir sind 
himself back in he didn't need his teammates in the end he's known to fry them well, he doesn't need them particularly here it seems uh, even to get himself back into the main pack had a wheel change wasn't happy with the handlebars he's been fiddling about with it maybe it's just the nerves of the man maybe he's up for great things yes you've got to be scared to do well here maybe he is just a little we'll take a break Here we go, um, plenty more of this. This one of the better laid, incidentally, which does have uh, pave sections, I should say, which does have... On this particular section, it's uh, three. It's quite a long section, 3.7 kilometres, category four. But uh, it's uh, certainly some of the guys at the back now are really in a little bit of distress. This race is a war of attrition. Obviously, there are manoeuvres off the front, but it's generally a wearing down process. It's a race you have to be very. <laughs> figure of Guliam van Kurzbach, the Belgian, the junior Paris-Roubaix champion in 2009 and absolutely piling on the pressure looking after his team leader and as we go to the back there it looks like Peter Sagan not in, well, in a little bit of trouble here Carlson. Uh, well it is and uh, uh, I thought he was much higher up than that uh, but he does look like he is in a bit of bother. He's not been happy with his bike at all so far today. 3 minutes and 48 is the gap with 78.6 to go and there we are. Uh, we are getting this string out that we were talking about. They weren't minded to attack when Cancellara went down because so many others were taken. I think if he had been alone, um, uh, things might have changed. It's different now. The pace is very high. And it's that man, Tom Boone, and absolutely piling on the pressure on the front. If you take a little bit of a look, a lot of the Amiga Farmer quick step riders look very, very similar. But uh, Tom Boone and absolutely piling on the pressure at the front of the Greg Van Ivermeer was in about fourth place looking very very strong too gritting his teeth to try and stay on the wheel which is smoother but it's also very very risky to take that line it can draw you in to the rough stuff on the right hand side and take you off into the ditch so you have to be absolutely on it physically as well as mentally and pilot your bike because sometimes you don't pilot the bike the pave does it for you very much so. Now, uh, we have 78.1 kilometres to go. We've got four men left in the break, incidentally, due to uh, punctures and, indeed, trains, <laughs> as you saw a few moments ago, um, getting in the way. Poor old Boucher from Francis de Joux was not a happy man. This is a great effort here, and it's the first of our real major pushes by a major team uh, that holds the favourites today. Omega Pharma Quickstep have got talent in abundance. Let's just tell you who they are, shall we? Tom Bonin, of course, already on four wins, looking for five. Oh, goodness me, and look at the way it's fracturing here on this. It's absolutely amazing. Kaiser, Mace, Stebar, Terpstra, Trentin, Van Kirspel and Vandenberg. What an outfit.
quite surprised to see uh, to see Tom Boonin driving so hard on the front. He glanced over his shoulder for a little bit of help from the front, say the De Jure rider, uh, but he shook his head. So it's Greg Van Arvemo who takes it up the front with Matt Heyman on his wheel, the big Arrange Australian rider powering along in a big gear. But look at Van Arvemo turning a little bit of a lower gear and has also opted for the little brakes on the top so you can help it. I think he's just opted for one brake just to dab on the, on the back to give you some more control, especially when cornering on the tops so you don't have to change your rhythm at all. Well, we said this was where the uh, tactics would come to the fore and it seems that uh, Omega Pharma quick step first to roll but BMC have power in abundance. Not only Greg Van Avermaet got himself a podium in Flanders, don't forget, uh, but they've got Marcus Bergot here as well. Tor Ushoft, naturally enough, great big powerhouse, probably not going to be uh, his year, unfortunately, this one. Uh, Tor just uh, a little bit longer in the tooth these days, but the Norwegian can always provide great support. And I think Taylor Finney is going to be a great call today. Uh, twice an under-23 champion, don't forget, at this event, the under-23 version of it. Uh, has been here twice before, so he knows what to expect uh, 15th and 23rd his last two finishing uh, positions so our BMC softening is up for a long one from Taylor it's already splitting up tremendously this is a very very long section of pavé as we said before it's 3.7 kilometers long and has a series of turns in it but look at the devastation is being caused and it's Greg Van Ivermeet who's causing it at the moment Tor Hushov isn't very far away I've seen Taylor Finney in the mix so BMC up there in numbers can't see too many Team Sky at the moment I know Geraint Thomas was brought down in that fall but definitely Nicky Terpstra is there for Amiga Farmer Quickstep a couple of uh, Belkin riders in the green and the black with the white stripe I would imagine uh, you've got Seth Van Mark there, but they're, they're up there in numbers two quite highly, as you can just see him going. Uh, one Sky Rider there. Lars Boom is uh, very much to the fore as well. Uh, damaged his elbow in Paris. A great right-hand man for Seth Van Mark. If, uh, oh, goodness me, you can get tagged at any time here, can't you? You can. There has been a bit of a regrouping. Uh, I see one of the uh, the NetApp riders there. It looked like one of the Amiga Farmer Quickstep riders. As we took that right hand, it did look like Tom Boone had had a bit of a trouble with his unshipped his chain. I'm not too sure. Pippa Pizzato it was uh, with a puncture uh, in the turn. So uh, just getting a, 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 probably a pinch puncture as well. If you see at the turn, it's kind of not tarmac and you're tempted to go and cut the corner. And if you do, you get into the sharp stuff and it's easily done. Well, we've had just about everything today, and the, uh, the uh, road of travails continues. Big, big push here going on from uh, the big man who we were mentioning just a few moments ago. Norwegian flag resplendent over the back of Tor Ushoft, and he's got those uh, uh, champions' rainbows upon his sleeves as well. A great engine room to have, and... What a softener as well. He's like a he's like a meat pummeler out there doing a proper job of tenderizing the entire field so that Taylor Finney can feast on them later. Definitely. Well, uh, for such a small country, Norway certainly has turned out three of the finest uh, classics riders. Of course, uh, Edvard Bosenhagen in the field, Alexander Kristoff taking out Milan San Remo, but uh, an interesting move by Tor Hushov. Bit of a foil, of course, for uh, possibly for Taylor Finney, who rode exceptionally well in the Tour of Flanders last week, up there all day. Well, and then it was Greg Van Avermaet who did, who rode tactically very, very well last week. Arguably hasn't got the biggest engine, but rides very much with his head. So BMC employing some very uh, interesting tactics at the moment. We could see Tour up the road. Yeah, very much so. Two minutes and 52 is the gap. Uh, 75.5 kilometres to go. So let's say where we're coming into next. In fact, it's only in 500 metres time. Start the colour of stones uh, for the Verlang to Brion. Uh, this is uh, sector uh, 15 on the countdown. It's categorised as three. But as we've seen, there have been some threes that have been a, uh, an absolute... something of a challenge out there. Benoit uh, Harrier has, uh, it was part of the break uh, originally, just dropping back. They had two men up there, including Clement Koretsky. 
Uh, I think the main man for, uh, 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 that was Brendan Schiller, I beg your pardon, AG2R, uh, that was Damien Godard. Now, he is a big, big powerhouse, and in fact, a, a well worth a side bet, and maybe he's just going for it early. Certainly, this is a very interesting move, too. The big teams have missed it. There's Belkins here in the shape of Lars Boone. There's also AG Dazar, Steve Chanel is also there, and the Tor Hoshad. But the main team to have mixed it is Amiga Pharma Quickstep and Team Sky, and of course, Cannondale. But BMC have got it, and it's a Cannondale who sensed the danger, followed by Lotto. Well, they're winding them in, uh, they're neutralising it at the moment. Lots of teams sending torpedoes up the road, uh, no destruction just for the time being. Uh, that has stuck, I should say. Time to regroup and uh, just hope for the level best. We'll take a break. Is it a joke? Yeah, it's a no, no, no. Yeah, is it? Yeah, is it? Yeah, Welcome back. Um, we have a battle back by the Sagan group to try and uh, just re-amalgamate with the main pushers. Michael Schaar, a few moments ago, just went on the attack. There he is, the Swiss champion, uh, front of uh, the bunch at the moment. Incidentally, the Tor Usjoft push failed, but there'll be plenty more. This is where the rolling attacks come. Now, Edvald Bosenhagen is not that far away, as you can see, so he's uh, just marking them out. Sooner or later, one of these breaks is going to stick. Now, Damien Godin, who was fifth last... Hey, come on, hey, jump! Hey. He's not him. Boucher! Hey, Boucher! Frenchman from AG2 à la Mondial in the brown and white is up there towards the front and he looks absolutely pepped, prepped and ready to go. Well, this is obviously not only one of the biggest races in here, it's always the biggest alongside the Tour de France, the biggest race in France, of course, so the French team specifically, this is arguably the biggest race of the year for them, so they'll be absolutely super motivated as Tour Hushot counters the attack from the IAM rider, again, absolutely at home on the cobble. Maar hij houdt ze. Daar zijn er. Yeah, can 
niet zien. Hop, hop. Posato was hier ook vooral. Posato. Kijk hier. Hop, hop, hop. Kijk. It certainly does favour the brave, and in this race, if you can attack and get up the road, if you're not one of the main favourites, but again, people will be concerned about Damien Gordon. Of course, he was fifth in Pirate Route Bay last year, a very talented bike rider. This will be one of his main focuses for the year. He'll be up the, again, if you can get up the road, get a little bit of distance, and then there's the natural selection that takes place behind. You can uh, just uh, find yourself, by virtue of the natural selection, actually in a, a very, very good position. So sometimes this race is won by... Uh, basically attacking and going up the road and being brave. And that's what we're seeing up ahead. These riders are actually uh, taking their chances. Uh, they are. Uh, going on Usof, uh, part of it. Usof uh, dead centre on the crown of the road. Uh, the other boys. Hey, oh. Hey. Here. Stop standing here. Hey, come on, eh? Stop them. Hey! Go on, eh? Sibar! Hey! Sibar! Hey, come on! Hey, come on! Vegas? Hey! 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 Incidentally, 18 punctures, we're hearing, went on in the Arenberg section. That was only 2.4 kilometres. Can you imagine just... Uh, that is a high attrition rate, and there'll be more sectors such as that to come. The next major, and by that I mean uh, five-star test, is the Molde... Uh as the peloton split into small bunches. They are regrouping as we speak, uh, but he was amongst those who was dropped. I can only assume it was uh, also a puncher because Bradley himself says he's absolutely up for this. Definitely. I know Bradley, uh, Bradley is a historian of the sport, uh, as well as being an absolutely legendary rider. He appreciates the history and the culture of the sport and would love to add this race to his Palmares. He was absolutely pleased as punch when he first finished the race, uh, of course. But again, this is a race, uh, it's quite a historic moment because Bradley Wiggins is the first Grand Tour winner to ride the Paris-Roubaix. Oh, look at that, somebody hit that central right. I can't believe that AG2R had actually stayed upright. He collected that with his left-hand shoulder and somehow stayed upright, oh. absolutely in the lap of the gods. I can't believe what I just saw. But to back talking about Bradley Wiggins, again, he is the first rider since Greg LeMond, of course, uh, our, new, uh, our new guy for Eurosport to uh, ride Paris-Roubaix, and that's since 1992, because this is a race for the specialists. Sector 14 doth beckon, and it's uh, Tilloy du Sars et Rosier, and it has its own peculiar nature, as they all do. 70.1 kilometres, uh, 145 is the gap. What are they dealing with on this one? Sector 14 on the countdown. Well, this was first used in 1980, but uh, it's uh, quite a long sector. It's at 2.4 kilometres. And again, quite rough in the centre of the road. You can see these roads are hardly used at all. There's grass growing in the centre of the road. They're very, very rarely used at all. But there's really some pressure being applied at the front. And it's, uh, oh, it won't be long before this, this three quarters, I don't think. Uh, the danger here is that on the one side of the road, you can see on the left-hand side in that, in that particular...
Has a bowl, so there's a real gully has been uh, has been taken. If you go in there, then it starts to throw you a bit like a half pipe uh, a snowboarder from one side to the next, and you can end up knocking into anybody. So you have to read every single sector here completely differently because sometimes the safe zone is not where you'd expect it to be. It's a difficult situation. Some riders, as you can see, there is a best line to choose. Obviously, the riders will have ridden most of these sectors in training in the previous weeks, but sometimes the best line is, ironically, the one that actually isn't so worn. The, the crown in the centre of the road is there because of the, the, the part of the roof, the, the cobbles either side, has been worn down over the years by the various tracks. But, of course, where it's been worn, it's also pitted. So, although it's a, a little bit more bumpier, it's actually more even in a bumpy way, if you, if you know what I'm trying to say, rather than the pitted uh, uh, sides. Well, I don't take my eyes off uh, the screen for, Ooh, for a, a big moment. Oh, and as I say that, because something may happen, and it just has. Oh, well, let's see who was being collected. So the camera at the, at the rear of this bunch may well just catch up in a moment. Uh, passing the dung piles on the right-hand side and um, uh, just seeing what's been generated by these guys. Let's have a look. It was well, it looks like they're up and gone, uh, if it was that sector. I think it might have been a little bit further up, uh, and uh, we still have some wreckage. Couldn't quite see who that was. It would look like it was one of the sky riders. Well, on certainly, that... but... <laughs> yep. Yep. We are obviously uh, on that left-hand corner. When you're hitting, when you're riding the cobble... Very active indeed, but of course under the tutelage of director sportif Mark Maddio, a former national road race champion, of course, double Paris-Roubaix winner. But of course, the French haven't won this race for 17 years. And they're fed up about it, I can tell you that much. Belgium have won this 55 times. It's very close to the Belgian border, Roubaix, of course. Originally it was a couple of textile magnets. We have a textile magnet, I'm not sure, uh, that uh, set themselves up with a velodrome and decides to race from Paris uh, to their velodrome. Big slew at the back wheel, and he's got a puncture, surely. That's Arnaud de Meros, one of the pre-race favourites for a Francie Le Jeux. We're talking about them. He's still riding along on a puncher, but the problem is... Here comes Dagan Kolb as well, being helped back into affairs. My goodness. This is exciting stuff. Sorry for cutting across you there, Carlton. But uh, the problem is, the reason Arnaud de Meros is, is a riding is because... 
The bunch is now split. Obviously, the team cars can't get in between the small gaps. There are lots and lots of uh, little neutral service pits along the route. He's going to try and get to one of those. But if he stops now, he could wait a minute, a minute and a half, because the race is absolutely detonated on these various difficult technical sections of Pave. So Demar has got to ride for as long as he can on his flat tubula. Yep, keep going with the back end slewing all over the place and just try and get to a, a friendly Swanier who might well just have a wheel for you a little bit later on. Oh, it's all strung out. The pace is absolutely at its highest at the moment. I haven't got an average for you, but I'll get that Well, as we take this break. Four hours and 23 minutes they've been in the saddle. And there's an awful lot more punishment to come. And it's rolling into it right now. We'll keep an eye. Well, they've abandoned the brake, and uh, here we are. We're still on full attack. Uh, attack mode, thank heaven for that. We'll stick with it as uh, we stay, and uh, they check over their shoulders as well. Oh, forgive me for that, but uh, we were uh, called to a, a commercial break, but just as they were all starting to uh, skirmish for, <laughs> for an assault, they're just going to level themselves now and go again. You can be absolutely certain. We will then keep an eye as they all seem to have a... Peloton, just in front of us, just as we come.
Welcome back. Uh, all hell's broken loose, <laughs> as I'm sure you can imagine. Uh, G went for it. Uh, Garrett Thomas, incidentally, uh, took Dagan Cobb with him. Um, Sagan did not look happy. In fact, uh, a few moments ago, uh, it looked like he was um, in, a, in a very bad place, let's put it that way. But he did take a feed bag. So he wouldn't be doing that unless he was thinking about setting up at the side of the road and having a picnic. But uh, Sagan, to me, does not look like a man who's got the demeanour of a winner today. He's had a bit of a torrid time, has Peter Sagan. He uh, wanted to do well in this race, but uh, it looked, to be honest with you, like he was ambling through the feed, did take a musette. He's going to have to rely, I think, on a, a, a little bit of a lessening of the tempo up front, but that certainly isn't happening. There's been a multitude of attacks. Hopefully we'll get this. Is obviously the leaders now with only 55 seconds. There is a chasing group with a couple of aged Desire riders in there. Also look like John Davenkolb and also the flying Welshman from Team Sky, Geraint Thomas also there. And they're soon coming up to the next sector of Pave, which will be sector 13, Beauvry La Forêt to Oshi. And that was first installed in 2007, actually. And there was some Pave laid for that particular section. Uh, there was Damien Godin, incidentally, is part of proceedings here. There's plenty of other talent as well. Uh, Bert the Backer is here for Giant Shimano as, uh, as backup, I guess. Um, let's just, just double checking to see if Dagan Kolb has actually made it to this group. Uh, right now, I can't see him. I think he may well have uh, uh, been replaced up front. Matt Lalangue for Francis de Jure is most certainly here, and it looks like some of the bigger names are further back. Somebody asked you, did uh, Cancellari get back up? Yes, he did. And in fact, you'll uh, catch sight of him. There he is, uh, not that far down off the main pack as well. A look at this. Uh, this does afford a little bit of cheating. Um, or let's say gamesmanship. Uh, there's a big, <laughs> not cheating at all. Um, there are sections here which have been concreted just to the side uh, to make life a little bit easier, and we wouldn't deny them that on a day like this. You certainly wouldn't. As I say, it's a Beverly La Forêt de Orchie as we head to the back. Armand de Mer, one of the favourites. It uh, looks like he has come off as the end to this particular section. First installed in the race in. Thomas. Do we have to pay more for this? Yes. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> Who was it? 2007, and actually there were some cobbles specially laid for the race. As we see in the tap, look at Tom Bonin, Mirbeck, the king of the cobbles himself. Four in his belt. He's looking for a number five. Oh, absolutely this be, resplendent. This would be superb. Now, who has got the bottle to go with him at the moment? As you can see, he's got a teammate doing a fantastic bit of uh, blocking further back. That's exactly what you need. Use your teammates to perfection in whatever way you can. And this man is a master, not only of strategy, but particularly particularly of this race and Tom Vernon has lit it up and this is serious this just sit back sip your drinks at home folks and look at the maestro at work what a devastating attack by Tom Bonin eyeing a number five he's riding his uh, specialized Roubaix bike a special custom frame just for this race 61 centimeter custom geometry with a very long reach, uh, reach and a, a very uh, shallow front end so he cuts through the air but look at him riding here oh. absolute perfection yeah and uh, you notice uh, they were on lockout duties as far as the easier section uh, that we were highlighting so if you wanted to get to Tom Bonin you had to go onto the car that's awesome you are watching Tom win the race right oh now oh my god no bridge with 65 Oh my god! <laughs> Go Taki! Oh, wow. wow. oh, yeah, Where the hell is Fabian? Does anybody know? Alright guys! Hey, can I have my paper bag? <laughs> no! I never turn mine in! Can I turn mine in now? Yes! <laughs> Someone's fallen off. You had to make, oh goodness me, the pennant man there uh, nearly. Oh, we've got another crash, and that did look like Dagan Cobb on the deck. Oh, and was that Paolini? Paolini, that obviously you can see is obviously ginger beard there, and obviously Michael Morcock has been slowed down by that. Oh, and there's plenty of them. Uh, my mistake, it was uh, single down. Sickle Dam uh, with Paolini on the road for Giant Shimano. So if you've had a wager on Dagen Kolb, uh, your uh, bet is still live. 63.4 uh, kilometres to go, and they're out of that pave section. They come short and sharp, some of them, and some of them very sharp indeed. I, I, look, this, this chap from Coford is catapulted into the ditch. It does actually look like the Estonian riding. Gert Yoar will have to get confirmation of that. But uh, cleared the side and ended up in the ditch, but he does look like he's OK. But this just shows how dangerous this was. This 
this is an absolute war of attrition. Yep, can't be anything else. We've got our Shia coming up next in 3.1 kilometres time. It's a rolling se series of punches, and uh, it's leaving us uh, uh, near breathless, but it's uh, fascinating. Sorry we haven't got to uh, too many of you on Twitter, but um, we'll have to. Sadly, my, uh, my screen is actually the other side of uh, the commentary position here, so I have to look away from the screen uh, in order to get your notes. I'll have a go in a moment, but um, it really is so much, so much drama uh, uh, revealing itself to us. And Bonin is with it, this very select group right now. And what talent we've got. Let's pick some of them out. Martin Chalingi is here, incidentally. Uh, domestic for Sepp Sep van Mark, but has found himself in a very privileged place indeed. Uh, Ladagneau um, is also here for Francis Sejour. A great man to have in a position such as this. And the panic set in. They're trying to uh, reach out and just well basically stay with what is becoming a very very lively group lively in terms of their potential uh, Damien Godin uh, fifth last year many forget uh, took a prologue on the Paris as well uh, Mr Godin he's also here for 82 on the Mondial and there's a lot of others who are very capable of delivering definitely uh, Julien Fouchard as well is there for co for this but that was David Miller from Garmin Sharp driving on the front he can sense the danger I mean, that was an absolutely amazing move. Tom Bonin knew that was a dangerous move ahead, decided to go across and, and to jumped across about a 15-second gap, and we can see Bradley Wiggins still in the mix there as well. Number yep. 51 just to the right of the screen in the centre. Cancellara is also there. Yeah, potentially this is a different game that these guys are going to have to play because with 62.1 kilometres to go, you think, nah, surely not. But did you see who was there? Wiggins, Sagan, Cancellara, and there is a gap, and significantly... It's being posed, or at least the, the question being posed, is by Tom Bonin, who's joined a very select bunch up front. They're going to have to fight hard. He certainly is. That was a very, very good move, very determined move by Tom Bonin. Going to make things a little bit easier for himself. He's going to start rolling through most of the guys in that group, looking like they're going to work. Obviously, Team Sky can just sit back and watch now, and obviously so can Amiga Farmer Quick Step. But to the major team to miss that, of course, is Trek Factory Racing. Garmin have also missed it too. How long do you go? It's a big question. Where do you go? Normally the big selections come with about 50 to go. They're early, but hey, they're going to ride into that zone of efficacy very, very soon. Well, of course, Tom Bonin on Sector 10, which is coming up very soon, Mons en Pevele. He actually jumped away and won solo in 2012 with an amazing 52 kilometers to go a few years back. So you can go long, but I don't think Tom Bonin has quite got that form, but he's put himself in an absolutely ideal position. BMC and of course uh, Trek Factory Racing on the back foot now and having to chase. Yeah, they're having to chase because they've stolen their plan. They've stolen their game plan. It was all supposed to be about Taylor Finney for BMC. Oh, and Tom Bonin's gone and done a long one. We know Taylor Finney's capable of doing that. If only they could transport magically uh, Star Wars styly Taylor Finney into that group, then we would have just a massive piece of potential up there. But unfortunately, they're playing catch up. A great position to be over the last few that you can just see the bunch chasing furiously behind. Will there be, will, the, will, will this group start riding together? They certainly look like they are at the moment, but they've opened up a bit of a lead, about 15 seconds. And again, they're looking around at the moment. Geraint Thomas putting himself in a good position there, deciding to bunny hop that roundabout. Looks like that's re reasonably safe to do so. Well, what can Damien Godin do for me? <laughs> We're going to find. <laughs> He is a talent. Can he deliver for France, notably? Uh, second in the pecking order, 28 wins for them. Belgium 55, Italy 13. We don't know where it's coming from today. Welcome back. Heading for sector 13 uh, from home on the countdown to launch. Bonin's not happy, and he's not happy because there's other riders here. He's basically saying to them, do you want to be Pisa history? If you do, then join the party, for goodness sake. Otherwise, the pack are going to be on us.
disgusted with them. Uh, go down was the only man who was. <laughs> driving, desperate to bring things back together for their young American upstart, Taylor Finney. Bonin's fed up with it. If you're going to do something well, do it yourself. He goes to the crown of the road and uh, look at the dust that's being kicked up by the camera bike. And, um, the way the wind is blowing today as well, occasionally it becomes a headwind and it's at that point that the dust just reels its way down the, uh, the peloton um, and uh, that's where it becomes a real choker. Fighting for position. <laughs> Although Greg Van Avermet, naturally enough, also very much part of their focus. And Marcus Burkhardt, you know, when you look through their, um, their list, they have so many tactical options. Do you know what? I think uh, Tom Bonin is starting to panic. He's a previous winner of this race. He's got, he shouldn't expect these riders to actually give him too much. They're essentially carrying the finest classics rider of a generation to the finish. If they do work, they're just going to tap through. He shouldn't panic too much. He needs to throttle back a little bit and think about the, the broader picture. There's still a long way to go in this race. He knows he's not perhaps 100% form. He's been improving over the last few weeks. Again, he does expect a little bit more help, but again, he's got, he's, I think he's panicking a little bit too much and he's doing a little bit too much work. There's a lot of cobble still to go, but of course, he is putting riders on the back foot, but of course, he shouldn't be carrying those, those riders too much. And I would, if I was Patrick Lefebvre watching these pictures, I'd say to him, hey, throttle back a little bit, Tom, you're panicking. I think it was Tom Bernan who actually said in response to a question at the top of the programme, uh, who do you fear amongst the youngsters out there that might deliver something? And the name was Taylor Finney. Well, um, maybe that is the fear and uh, maybe they heard what was going out on Eurosport and maybe they're trying to deliver their young American into a great position here and indeed uh, to try and neutralise what this man can deliver if he has the help and he's going to need help today he's shaking his head he's still not happy he's muttering <laughs> he's he, he is muttering like a hermit at he's, the moment he certainly is it's a feels good like one too it's a good position to be in but as he as he takes a bit of a gel obviously on a day like this it's so arduous relentless i mean uh, and strenuous a task for these riders these are at the pinnacle of, of fitness, of course, these riders are they're almost made for this sort of course. As we talked about earlier on, this isn't a race for the climbers. It's a, there's only very, very few stage race riders who can do this. There's a, a very, very select group of riders who've actually won Paris-Roubaix in a Grand Tour, of course. Amongst them, Phyllis Gimondi won the Tour and Paris-Roubaix, 65 and 66. Jan Janssen of Walter and Paris-Roubaix, obviously Eddie Merckx. Famously, Bernard Hino won the tour five times and also Paris-Roubaix, a race that he absolutely despises and hates as we look at the, the mud-caked face of Manuel Quinziato and, of course, Sean Kelly won this race 84-86 and the Walter in 88, but a select few, Carlton. Femi Cancellaris here. Uh, you look down as well and you'll see that Matt Heyman and the boys, probably working for Jens Kirkelaire, we believe, also there, and they're staying very much uh, towards the fore now, Orica Greenedge. It is because it's becoming the... Uh, the 
business end of the day. We have the Mons and uh, Pevele, don't forget, coming up. That is one of the three five-star sectors that we're dealing with. Red stars for devilment, perhaps. Uh, next up, though, is sector 11. It's sector 10 on the countdown, the Mons and Pevele. Uh, but we are waiting, Pavela, beg your pardon, no accent on the final E. Uh, but this is the Oshi Les Oshi du Berzei that they are coming into, and they'll be there in about 1400 metres time. Bonan Thomas, Godin Ladigno, and De Bakker with Martinez, also here from Europe Car, and they've still got a gap. It's only 11 seconds. Again, Tom Bonan taking a little bit of a different line round that right hander. Obviously, his, his eye absolutely on the gain. He'll know this. Uh, he'll know this route very well. But a rather slender lead now, and it's under the impetus of a very well drilled. BMC Racing Team, Greg van Avermaet's there, Marcus Burkhardt is there, Hushot is there, Taylor Finney tucked nicely in the wheels, a double under 23 winner of course, Manuel Quinziato putting an amazing amount of work in on the front under, at the moment, and on his wheel in the white is the Swiss National Road Race Champion, Michael Shah. Great to see Orica Greenwich getting themselves into a fantastic position, they're not having to do the work here at the moment, I, I guess uh, Taylor Finney had his ideas about how this race would pan out and in fact it's not going to plan at the moment and so they are trying to if you like uh, make this a clean sheet of paper there's Bradley Wiggins right inside of your screen with the uh, British Union Jack upon his uh, uh, jersey doing a fantastic job at the moment Sky have also got their own options probably not coming into this race amongst the out and out favorites but Edval Bosenhagen can never be denied we've seen Norwegians playing major parts throughout the classics uh, this year uh, we've mentioned of course, Christoph, we've mentioned uh, as well uh, Tor Usof, who's uh, racing brilliantly here as part of the BMC team. But don't discount or forget about Edval Bosenhagen. He may have been a little bit quiet by uh, the level of expectation which is heaped upon that man, but he could deliver today. You never know. Edward Bosenhagen is the out-and-out -out leader, and of course with Geraint Thomas being in the move, it's, it's given a free ride to Sky, but this is very interesting, obviously BMC have strength in numbers, six riders, but by showing, I mean, they obviously want to shut this down, they sense the danger, you certainly don't want to let the rider of the calibre of Tom Boonen up the road, but it's interesting because they put so many guys on the front, rather than suggest other teams help with the lurk lo workload, it means the other teams can sit back and relapse, le leaving it all to BMC, so they've certainly put their cards on the table very, very early, especially if there are other major teams, Trek Factory Racing being one of them, Fabian Cancellara at the moment being carried along and all his teammates have been saved as well, yeah. apart of course from the ones that fell off in that crush earlier on, but very interesting that BMC haven't uh, opted for other teams to help with that chase, quite an interesting tactical situation. I think it's because they're on burn down and uh, this is uh, a Sagan tactic that he's often used within uh, the Cannondale team, which is why, so, which is where you slowly but surely you burn out your teammates and then you go along because you've got a defined action point along the way and I think that's what Taylor Finney has got. I think he's got a master plan and he's starting to use up his men right now. Uh, just peeling off the nose. He's down a man. That's fine. That's the way he wants this to work as we roll into this next series of power. Don't forget the Mons on Prevel is coming up with 49 to go. So it's only... Sorry. and Godin it is that's taking a big churn at the moment and uh, Bonin will like that he'll appreciate that Gone this, to the grass, for goodness sake. Are is, they mad? This is a very, very difficult sector. It's Orchilles, Orchilles de Bercy. It's 2.7 kilometres in length. It's rated Category 4, and it actually goes in a semi-circular shape. So there are some gradual bends on this. But look at Tom Bonin. A picture of style. They've gone for diff different bottle cages on their bikes. Tom Bonin actually riding with only one bottle cage. I don't know if it's actually snapped off. Normally, riders would use carbon fibre. They've opted for steel and titanium in this race because it grips the bottles better. But the power of Tom Bonin has snapped the, the elastic in that 
breakaway in the course. Riders looking for the smoothest line at all, searching out the smoothest bit of road. And on this case, it's to the right-hand side. It's that very, very thin section of, uh, of grass and mud. But look at this, absolutely blown at the break apart. Tom Boonen is absolutely flying at 53 kilometers to the velodrome. It is. Uh, Godin, in fact, was the man who suffered there. He'd just done his turn on the front when Boonen attacked. And as a result... <laughs> Flanders was narrowly pipped to the line by Tom Boone and the man who sits on his wheels. Both of these guys putting the cost down to the rest, but a man notable as absent and riding very quietly and cautiously and carefully is he a cat about to pounce, and that's Fabian Cancellara. Well, he's got to do something. It's a bridgeable gap uh, at the moment. Tor Usoft is uh, still um, putting a... <laughs> Putting it a great turn here as they just uh, exit on to a newer section of Pave, which looks a bit smoother, uh, but they've still found a comfort zone in the gutter as we speak right now. So is that Bert de Bakker then um, of uh, Giant Shimano who's up the road? Tor wants to join them and have some fun. Here he is. Who's he going to drag out from the chasers as well? Monty Group Gobert have got uh, uh, Bjorn Leukemans who's trying to get over because he's got uh, Tim Detroyer who was part of that push, unless that is Detroyer uh, reigniting himself. I can't quite believe he'd have the capability of doing that, but nonetheless, uh, 51.8 to go. It is Debacker actually from the John Shimano. He's not going to give Tom Boone in the turn. Why should he? He's got John David Cobb, who this year won Game Babel Game, a superb sprinter, and uh, gradually developing to a very, very good classics rider again. So Debacca not giving Tom Boonen a turn at all. Oh, the Garmin rider there just went broadside like a speedway rider. Is that Sebastian Langville? I can't quite tell, but Langville, one of the favourites from, uh, from Garmin shot. But Tom Boonen absolutely motoring at the moment. Again, still leading this group, and it's only Geraint Thomas and Boonen who are doing the work at the moment. Yeah, I believe uh, Van Mark is amongst a quartet of Belkin boys who are just starting to pick up the cudgel. And believe me, once they are armed, they can beat the entire peloton with that weapon uh, Tor Ushoft is aware of that and he's riding uh, brilliantly today I'm wondering if, if Tor is going to be uh, one of the big surprises today it would be fantastic if he is it certainly is but again there's a long long way to go it's very easy 
on this stage. And Tom Boonen said last week he was riding extremely strong. He was was very very happy with his ability, but he did just he lost it all with 23 k's to go. I just hope he isn't doing too much for his sake. But he is working an inordinate amount at the moment. But of course, in doing so, it's it's a double-edged sword. Do you do too much or do you wait till later? But what he is doing, he's putting the cat amongst the pigeons, and there's a lot of panic behind. Uh, there is. <clears throat> uh, Set van Mark as well is uh, part of that Belkin group. He was over to the right-hand side of the road, so left-hand as you looked at it. And uh, this looks like a hiatus. I've had enough of uh, carrying you all on my own, uh, says Bonan, as uh, Tor Usof comes up and joins the party. That's not a grin, it's a grimace. Tor Usoft is in the house, and um, when he's in the house, uh, you have to give him first pick of the chair. Uh, he is a big man, he is a gorilla of a man, and uh, believe me, he can savage just about anyone. Uh, it's make-up time for Belkin, and uh, they have to make up this gap and make sure that they are part of the fun. It's a very dangerous manoeuvre, obviously, uh, Belkin have sent the date. They were driving hard on the front. It's always funny in, in racing sometimes, uh, you get to within a couple of hundred metres or even 50 metres and then they stop working. It's, uh, it's always a bit of uh, a tactical uh, bit of shenanigans in relation to who's going to shut that last bit. But of course, at this point in the race, it's absolutely crucial you, you, you ride sensibly and tactically because if you drive somebody to the back of a brake, you're in danger of somebody going over the top. So that's why these riders are looking at each other, constantly checking what each other's doing. But again, it's given a bit of impetus to the breakaway again. But uh, Geraint Thomas, looking over his shoulder, decides to freewheel in the sensing that there is a bit of a coming together. Time to take a bit of a, br a breather for him. Yeah, uh, leave yourself something else to get on the next break if that suddenly happens. If they roll through an attack, you want to have something left in the legs. And guess who? Tor Usov decides to just change the acceleration, the tempo ever so slightly. He goes off the nose. You can get a big selection at this point. And in one kilometre's time, they are going to be on the Monster Pavel. And this is going to hurt. It it is a big one. It's crucial. It's three kilometers long. And this is where the huge shakeout is. One of the safest places to be is up front. Tor knows that, and that's why he's here. It certainly is. This is a five-star sector, of course, as uh, as ranked this year for the first time. And, of course, this is where Tom Boonin attacked back in 2012. I wonder if we'll see him do that this time. But uh, there's, there's a backing off in the bunch. Nobody's going to shut down that last few hundred metres. But, of course, this is ideal for the brakes. So Tom Boone, I've no doubt, will look behind and sense it and actually start to apply the pressure again. Uh, Wiggins is on the uh, left-hand side of the road. Just behind him, uh, the uh, uh, Slovakian champion, Peter Sagan, who won the E3 and uh, wants to do some damage here. But he's going to have to get himself further down the road right now because there's, it's starting to be a uh, collection of talent up front, albeit some that you might not expect. Tor Ushoft is there. Uh, that's one that we did. Uh, <laughs> did not, I should say. Tom Bonin certainly is. Uh, Van Mark is looking to bridge. He's wondering whether to pre when to press the go button. Uh, Fabian Cancellara is also within this group. Group. Sagan, Wiggins, Cancellara, a lot of talent, a lot of possibilities, but they are in danger of letting this slip from their grasp. 49.1 to go. It's not much of a gap at the moment. It is bridgeable, but they're concerned about conserving energy, and wisely so. Definitely a BMC now just backed off a little bit after working uh, very, very hard earlier on, but it's uh, the Trek Factory Racing Boys, obviously uh, under the instruction of Fabian Cancellara to start driving this down because this is a very dangerous break. Belkin were chasing earlier on. It looks like the figure of Bram Tanking, who's now got into that mood. So that's another big team who don't have to work. Again, putting pressure on uh, the current and reigning champion, Fabian Cancellara, to put some troops on the front to bring this back. BMC have done their turn. They're probably going to sit back now. They've got Tor Hushod in the front group. So it's all down to the Defending champions seem to bring this back. It is all down to that. And I'm just looking at Van Mark wrestling to get himself into a decent position. There is uh, Bradley Wiggins just drifting out of your screen right now. Uh, Sagan is very much uh, to the fore of this group as we speak. And it's looking very, very lively. They're digging, wrestling, trying to find Van Mark. We haven't quite found him just yet. Uh, Van Emden is also very much part of this group. And they're sailing through and getting themselves into position and they're remustering themselves. Michael Shah has been called back onto duty here for BMC. Taylor Finney's also here. It's a great stepping stone for BMC as they approach on the enter sector 10, of course. And this is Mons en Pevelet, three kilometers long. This is a very, very testing set. There is actually a slight drag. It's normally a very flat course, as we saw Tor Hushov on the front, on the crown of the cobbles, driving for home. Well, it almost seems unfair. He's, uh, it's difficult to relay once you, once you get into this...
very defined good part of road. Uh, you can't really call for anyone to take over because you're hogging the best bit. And uh, that's exactly what Usoft is doing at the moment. If you drift off the absolute crown of this very ancient road that we're mentioning, Napoleonic, a lot of these were laid down to move armies. Um, right now, they've got a uh, platoon behind them and it's rack full of talent. We've had a big thinning down. There's 47.8 kilometers to go. They're on one of the major pieces of pave. Don't forget the uh, Carrefour de Arbre still to come. That's way down the road. We've still got 30 kilometers to go before we get to that next category five. But there are one, two, three, four, five other sectors of pave along the road. That's cobbles uh, to you and me. And believe me, this guy, <laughs> Tor Usov, is laying it down. And look at this. We've got two great men out front. Just how hard is the King of Belgium? I'm not talking about the King of Belgium, who is the actual king who has a queen. I'm talking about Tom Bowden. He's not even wearing any gloves. I know he's got double bar tape wrap, but how tough is he? He's not wearing gloves. I can't believe it. My hat, hat's off to him. But uh, Tom Bowden, absolutely, I don't know, driving it today. Really putting the cosh down today. Totally determined to make history. He could be the, the fifth rider, well, the, only the, sorry, the, to win this for the fifth time, would make himself basically part of the lexicon of the Paris Roubaix. Uh, a lot of riders actually not wearing gloves. The reason is their handlebars are padded. So you give up the padding on the gloves and you uh, have it on the bars themselves. Um, <clears throat> and it, sometimes you dispense with them as well because the grip is just too big and it's just uncomfortable. Some lunatic with a flag uh, flapping it in the face of the leader. That's exactly what you don't need. Uh, hopefully a member of the CRS which operate in this part of the world will be uh, paying him a visit in just a few moments time. Uh, 47 kilometers remaining and we are deep in the second of our big uh, <coughs> excuse me there is the nutcase uh, in our big uh, categorized five that's uh, five star cobble sections this is the middle of the two that count of the 28 we're dealing with today look at the power that uh, Tom Bonin is forcing through his belt to backer Thomas and of course Very well for Europe car, holding holding steady particularly well, but uh, Tom Bonin riding on the crown of the road. It is the best place to ride, otherwise you can get drawn into the side. But Bonin riding an immaculate race. When will we see Fabian Cancellara come to the form? At the moment, he looks like, I don't know, the embodiment of calm in an absolute maelstrom. Well, he's bridged this sort of distance before, and he's actually done it alone. And he's with other riders who will also be unhappy about this scenario. And it's Belkin that are coming to the fore and Zep van Mark. Last thing they want to do is give a free taxi ride to Fabian Cancellara, and he's at hand. Uh, there is the man who was doing so much of the work for AG2 à la Mondial, Damien Godin, and he's uh, riding for some respite at the moment by the look of things. He is a big man, and I think he might well be in need of a big, big break here. Look at the flags and how they are working. That's not the helicopter, that is the wind. And you can see the dust that's being kicked up by all of the broken sections of the peloton. Uh, if we get a long view, you'll see it um, just hanging uh, like a fog in the air as it's uh, just blown uh, at, in a ball if you like across the fields cutting his way through them all at the moment is the smiling figure of Toyusov he knows the camera's on him little light goes on on the top of the camera and says this is live now and he knows it he's never been more alive He's up. Look at his face, caked with dust. This really is the hell of the north. And in fact, it was uh, using Christophe, the first ever Mayo Jean in the Tour de France, that actually proclaimed this is the hell of the, the north after, in 1999, looking at the route and how devastated it was post the Great War. And that's where that phrase is, co uh, is coined. And this really is the hell of the Look at the devastation behind the leading group here. I presume, sorry, button trouble. Uh, I presume that would have been 1919 then. 1919 it was. <laughs> a long time ago. As opposed to 199, otherwise he would have been Nostradamus himself, throwing his mind forward to the degradation and uh, de uh, that, that is to come. 45.5 uh, kilometres is still to come here. And still they're working the road and still BMC...
Victor. Come on, he says. Let's do it. Put your gels in your body and turn those pedals, for goodness sake. They ain't going to do it for him. Not to the standard he requires. And that's a standard which is beyond most riders, I'm afraid. <laughs> He's showing his disquiet partially for us, but also partly for the fans back home if he doesn't deliver. At least he'll have an excuse, I guess. Goodness me, as if he needs one. Uh, Fabian Cancellara then, he's about uh, eighth man down, maybe tenth of uh, this chasing pack. Van Mark is here, plenty of others as well, very capable. Would it be those two again? Oh my goodness. They make the turn, and uh, once again, it's the turn to torture. Uh, Meniers to Avalin. It is sector nine on the countdown. We started on 28. Peter Sagan has done a great job, actually. If he doesn't look comfortable, he's constantly twitching on the bike. Maybe nerves, who knows? You've got to have plenty of those if you want to turn it into energy. This is only a categorized two danger level or uh, ardor level. <laughs> yes, and it's uh, only, it's a short one as well. It is, it's a, just primarily straight, uh, in a, basically in a, in a straight line, first used in 1981 and at the year of uh, the victory of Bernard Hino, who actually vowed never to return to the race. I think it's an urban legend. He did actually return, I believe, uh, after that, but uh, is a man quite vocal, uh, considering he's actually part of the Tour de France organizer that doesn't like that race. But the gap now opening up to uh, 30 seconds, and it's Hushov on the front, it is. driving the pace. And it's a, a slight downhill section as well, this, and from the boom crane, which has been engaged by our host broadcasters here, uh, they're doing a fantastic job. Uh, you can see the pace that is being maintained. It's been a very, very quick quick one we've been uh, riding for what five hours uh, just over five hours now unbelievable uh, 214 kilometers also already completed um, we've got uh, 42 or so um, left the average speed today 41.7 that's reasonably quick it's a slight it's a very very slight cross headwind all day long for these riders today but uh, again that can feel uh, I don't know, like a gale, the, the, the last part of the race. There's lots of exposed bits of road coming into the final 30 kilometers, but it's still Tom Bone, and he's actually getting a little bit, bit of help now from Debacker. Push up about to relay through to his turn as well. This group working really well, and again, it was interesting to see that effectively Belkin were riding a decent tempo, more to deter any other attacks than actually chase this down. The lead now up to 35 seconds. We've got 37 and a monitor. 35 is what is on the blackboard there for this leading group of riders. But uh, no real concerted chase from behind. And again, 39 seconds now the lead. 39 seconds it is, and uh, that is actually eking out. It's getting, uh, it's getting wider. And it's because there is, they're not, it's not a vocal argument, it's just a sense that nobody wants to take this on. And I wouldn't be surprised if Cancellara himself decides, look at this, what are you doing, guys? <laughs> decides to have a go. It's his teammate, actually, who's come up uh, to the fore. But uh, Cancellara will have an opinion on how this is panning out. Is he playing a clever game here? Well, I guess we'll find out at the end. 44 seconds now, and that gap is starting to look like a serious one with just 40.9 to go. This is a very dangerous move. Belkin and Team Sky and obviously BMC, the main teams in the race in, the, in what's left of, of the peloton there. And I reckon that there's only about 25 to 30 riders there. I did notice Luke Rowe, the young Welshman riding for Team Sky, was also there with uh, Sir Bradley Wiggins, of course. They're riding at the front, effectively blocking. But uh, Belkin were just riding a nice, loose tempo. But uh, Fabian Cancellara has obviously sensed a little bit of da danger and rather than actually send his troops to the front to really drive this back, it's to the very least keep the tempo high because it was in danger of drifting uh, out quite a long way but at 47 seconds now this now is looking like a very very serious move you know Fabian Cancellara is not a man who blinks um, obviously he does you know what I mean under pressure um, on a stare down but right now he's got a lot of questions to ask not only of himself but of his team and this gap is starting to look like a serious one and with Tom Burnham up the road are we about to make a bit of history I know it's a long call with less than a minute with 40 odd to go, but such is the terrain that we're dealing with, um, or rather I should say the road surface that we've got to deal with along the way. But gaps do hold in this game, especially with the depleted energy that can just be one speed out there, which means that gaps are held when you get onto the pave, and we've still got plenty more sectors to come. This is a very select group 
Obviously, Chilingi is there, of course, Tohusha, Geraint Thomas coming into form and blossoming now as a specialist classics rider. Obviously, eighth in the Tour of Flanders last week and uh, not riding actually in support of Edvald Boas and Hagen. But what a foil. I mean, Sky now can just rest and follow the, the, the moves rather than having to having to chase at all. But all of the major teams, apart from the defending champion uh, of Trek Factory Racing, Fabian Cancellar, are in this move and they're gradually going out. But if there's one guy, if there's one guy in this field that can bridge a gap like that, and he certainly doesn't seem to be panicking at all, it is Fabian Cancellara. He'll know these sectors like the back of his hand and may just be picking his moments. It may well be. That's Taylor Finney right next to him, just uh, stretching out his hams. Um, uh, and uh, we'll see how he goes, just uh, easing the calf muscles. I imagine the uh, lactic acid is a constant problem here. You, you think you only get it really when you're in... Uh, in the high mountains but believe me the pace that they're having to maintain here especially under these conditions as Tor Usof yet again just comes and does the Viking job out front he's doing an amazing job right now he's doing a job though for Tom Bernan he's um, maybe he's doing it for himself um, but we'll see whether it's his teammates he's helping out and is actually going to be a warlord that you're going to use a little bit later on uh, these are questions that will be answered later of course uh, last time that you can possibly go for attacks is probably 15 out uh, that's where we go to the Paris de Grouson um, that's uh, just over a kilometer in length and I'm just wondering whether they're going to hold their keep their powder dry for that moment BMC joining Belkin now on uh, uh, just upping the ante definitely set van mark is in second position here they have sensed the danger I don't think the rider up the road for Belkin uh, in their brand tanking is the rider they want hence they're now applying some genuine pressure there's a different look about oh, it and a proper Bamak. attack yes he just rolled off the nose and now he's gone for it well Cantillar is trapped here and he's got to find a way through great to attack on a narrow section and that's exactly what he's done he had a teammate with him it looked like a foil they've just increased the tempo and he has just completely gone with this and he's inviting others to challenge him and right now that man is not Cantillar who suddenly realizes the danger oh and there is the man who wears the number one and this is real and he's got an anchor on his back here indeed that was a fantastic attack by the runner-up last year set van mark it's greg van Ardemey and sebastian langveld who were trying to shut the gap down you can just see in through the dusty haze and look oh, at fabian cancellara finds another gear delivers it now will he just ride on if he gets up to van mark he'll probably join alliance with him and then head off to try and capture bonan and usoft and company who are a little bit further up the road 45 seconds is the gap to the Husoft group don't forget but that shows you what what Cancellara has got in terms of response. There's a couple of full of, of 90 degree turns on this particular section of Cavi, which are very, very technical indeed. But Set, Set Van Mark went round that uh, corner with a, a, a great degree of deft bike handling, extremely skillful, has stayed upright, opened up a bit of a gap. But Fabian Cancellara, absolutely resplendent, beautiful on the bike, soaking up these cobbles and closing down that gap. He is. Um, he's giving um, Lars Bohm a free ride. And so this is uh, kind of an intermediate one, two, if you like. If Cancellara gets back, Bone will attack. Uh, believe me, 37.4 kilometers to go. 34 seconds back to the Usoft group. And uh, we're looking at Samu. Uh, really found a day of struggle and I'm not surprised that uh, just uh, caught sight there of Damien Gaudin once again and Here we are. Here's our men at front back to the break That was Nicholas Arndt from team John Shimano just drifting off the back of what is now becoming a, a drastically reduced uh, bunch but it's Seth Van Mark who was still pursuing with this. He senses the danger. He knows Tom Tom Boonen is dangerous. He knows Geraint Thomas is dangerous. And combined with two Hushov, three arguably the strongest riders in the race. But look at the face of Fabian Cancellara. That is a poker face, if ever I've seen one. Supremely confident, but does sense the danger too. The gap now been shaved under the acceleration of Seth Van Mark to under half a minute to 27 seconds, 36.9 kilometers to go. Wow. Well, I guess now you, you're starting to see the selections that are going to be made, and it's, it's been one of attrition, really, so far. Uh, we had a big, long race before we even got to the Pave sections, let's not forget. Um, that uh, making up, what, 97 or so kilometres of the beginning of the race. And then the Pavés begin. 28 sections of them today, 28 seconds. Come on, do your turn, for goodness sake, he says. <laughs> They've got company. 
Fabian Cancellara does look extremely cool. He gently waved them through. There was no uh, e exaggerated gesticulations that we saw from Tom Bonin, which says to me that Fabian Cancellara is playing this very, very calmly. He's not panicking. He's a th obviously, he's a three times winner himself. He's under a little bit less pressure. He's got the Tour of Flanders under his belt, but I think there's an increased sense of urgency and determination with Tom Bonin. But I think the cool customer at the moment is Fabian Cancellara, sat in uh, third place at the moment, out of the saddle, stretching those legs. Well, it is a uh, fabulous event, this. It's uh, the 112th running of it, by the way. Uh, started in 1896. Uh, somebody will write some history today. It, it may be a first chapter. It may well be just another trophy for the cabinet. We'll find out. Oh, Sagan goes for it just up the inside. Well, uh, Sagan, this was the moment that he went for it in the dirt and said, uh, you know what? <laughs> I feel like it again. Um, he took his feed bag. He looked uh, quite nonchalant, and I don't know whether he's doing that for the cameras. In response, Tom Bonin decided to break away from his uh, co-breakers and make it a solo effort because he knows the danger that is approaching and decided he was going to change the tempo as well. And so here we are with Bonin uh, trying to stretch his legs and indeed just break the heart of those who are around him because he knows that uh, Sagan is on his case. It's a great little manoeuvre up the inside there, quite a cheeky little manoeuvre, and as we said, a lot of these moves just go on the tarmac bit when there's a bit of a relaxing, but a great little manoeuvre. He's had a bit of a torrid day today, Peter Sagan, but a great little skirmish, and he is eating into this lead, but Tom Bonin has now decided to go alone, but it looks like his days are numbered, takes a bit of a sip, has glanced around and see that it's Geraint Thomas closing the gap down, but an interesting manoeuvre, he's obviously feeling very, very confident in deciding to go alone, with still 33 kilometres to go. Even. I just think he wanted uh, some help, and for them to uh, just join the fun, as it were, uh, certainly we're having fun out here, and hope you are too. Next pave section, incidentally, coming at 33, and they just go for it right now. Here it is, 33.5. Uh, the ticker just slightly out there. It's only a sector two, and you can see the meters counting down. A terrific little graphic that our hosts have provided was here. Um, it's uh, an ASO race, incidentally. It's uh, only a, the, uh, the the management team that handle the Tour de France for us. It's a, yeah, it's only a very very short section. Temple of Moulin de Bertin. It's a half a kilometre long, but in the pretty rough cobbles, but only very, very short, as we see Peter Sagan, and along with... Uh, Steinman Berg, it is, uh, that's been drawn out. Uh, I beg your pardon, uh, it is uh, Martin Reynolds, uh, forgive me, uh, that's gone with him. Uh, this is the push, and look, BMC have suddenly picked this one up as well. I think they're all starting to have some belief. They've heard that Bonan is looking like he's in trouble. He keeps pushing on, shaking his head, and then being caught. That doesn't bode well. Silly as he takes a glance by, and he has now been uh, brought back to heel by uh, Geraint Thomas, primarily, who looked like he obviously saw the danger there. You don't want a four times champion going up the road, but uh, they've really backed off the pace here. They're obviously looking at each other, sensing there's some of the most difficult cobbles still to go. And look at the frustration that Boonen is showing here, not acting particularly calmly. He is panicking a little bit. Oh! He doesn't want to do that. Oh, Peter Sagan, a lovely little bunny hop there, showing his BMX and mountain bike skills. Nearly came off and hit a spectator. Just got down in that little drainage ditch just there, but Bonnie hopped his way. One of the best bike handles, of course, in the peloton. How did they keep that one upright? Well, we're uh, going to have a little picture-in-picture, picture and we caught up with Sagan a little bit earlier on today. And uh, he's talking, speaking in Italian. Uh, we'll keep an eye on the action, because we'll... know it to look at him he's been tested tested and tested again Orica Green Edge constantly within the fold here as well which is great news for fans down under who are tuning in on uh, Eurosport Australia you're more than welcome uh, it's great to have you along for the ride on what is uh, turning into an absolute classic here and you know that the final chapters um, have not been told by a long way 
and working out what's going to happen here is virtually impossible. There are so much talent up towards the front, despite the fact that it's heavily depleted so far. Let's just hear from Peter Sagan, shall we? Tanti domani possono vincere, poi non so come va la gara. Questa uh, many gara riders can beat uh, Fabian tomorrow. Um, I don't uh, know the race so is if it's going to be me, uh, uh, but you always need some luck out there, he says. Uh, my third time here, uh, uh, my first time I, I gave up before the end, the second time I was just happy to finish, and now I'm here to get more experience to see what happens. Uh, and favourites, well, um, they're always the same. Uh, you always have the same favourites. So who can beat Sagan? Uh, everybody, he says. <laughs> ah, che, che uh, no, bit of modesty. Um, uh, let's see what's going to happen tomorrow. You know, Peter Sagan has, um, he's grown up a, a lot. His, um, his maturity has shone through this year, and he's not, not let himself be downhearted by a sequence of second places. Um, the, the hatful of victories that were supposed to come his way have not. All right, he, he did well in E3, but um, he was expecting more, I think, from this season. I think. It would put all those doubts to bed in his own mind and everyone else's if he did something today, and he's in a great position. Well, he's had a very difficult start to this particular race, numerous mechanicals, punctures, but uh, obviously uh, he's riding out of his skin at the moment. He is closing down uh, the gap in between uh, himself and, uh, and the peloton. He should, if he continues at this rate, should make the junction very soon as we have the helicopter shot of the chasing bunch, which is even reduced now to probably 25, 30 rods. But Sagan took a fantastic victory in E3. But of course, he's such a prodigious talent. And incumbent with being such a talent and such a shining star is the pressure that comes with it. And of course, that's very difficult. He's still a very, very young man. I don't think he's the, uh, I don't think he's the finished article yet. But again, he can continue to surprise. And if he were to make contact with, the gr with this group, he probably is the fastest rider. So get him to the velodrome in this group. He could be a real threat. Uh, that is absolutely correct. And um, uh, everyone realizes it. And that's why they were so busy. Uh, and in fact, why Bonin suddenly just uh, got very busy as well. Um, you're looking at Borat Bosic. Now, he's, it looks like he must have had a puncture. Oh, he's not happy with the bike. There's something wrong. I don't even know whether he's been down. Let's just have a quick look and see what the issue might be. Because he was looking very lively as well to try and join Sagan. He did. He did try and bridge across the gap. Ooh, looking behind there, well, just on the other road as well. That's a dangerous thing. We've seen that happen before. You've got to be so careful. This course is so technical. And again, with the group ebbing and flowing, He's on his uh, S-Works Roubaix frame there. If you just look closely at the forks, there's little Zert inserts, and the back stays and the front stays, and they actually act as a little bit of a shock absorber. It's a different frame than the normal S-Works frame, and that frame has a slightly higher front end, but it's specifically designed for the cobbles and actually co-designed by Tom Bonin. This time of the race, with 30 kilometers to go, you think, all right, you can get yourself a puncture and relay back, back on with uh, maybe just a little bit of drafting, maybe with a teammate. It's a very tough thing to do. You get distance now because the pace is so high and it's absolutely relentless. And the pace, as we mentioned earlier, when you get onto the pavé sections, is nearly matched. It's very difficult. There are very few riders who can find that extra few kilometres per hour. Cancellara, of course, is one of those on the cobbles, which is why he's had so much success here. But it's almost you're neutralised out of it. That's the trouble if you get a puncture now. It is a, it is a fine art, obviously, too. It, it's simple, isn't it? If, if you have a puncture and you stop, you then, to get back on, you've got to ride faster than the group in front. And at this stage of the race, with over five and a half hours riding in the legs, and, of course, with the, the relentless pounding that the body has been under for so long, with these very, very stressful sections of pave, it makes it a difficult proposition, unless you can get into the convoy, which is now uh, a very, very much shortened because of the reduced peloton. We've got some massive sections to come, not least the Carrefour de l'Arbre. So we are going to take our final commercial break and then we'll be back with the run for home, the velodrome in Roubaix. I cannot wait. I cannot wait. It's going to be magnificent and I hope you stay with us. We'll be back in a moment.
Alter! Was ist da drinnen hier? Da, da, Sagam, Sagam. Sagam einfach Marke. Oh, Peter! Peter! Sagam! Hier heel nu op. Hier zit Cancellara. Oh, Greg! Oh, Fabian! Oh, Fabian! Welcome back, and it looks like... that was sent up in the form of Martin Weinitz, domestic for Zep van Mark, has done a good job of neutralising the effort of... Uh... <laughs> Back in Sagan and Weinitz from uh, Belkin, both men in green of uh, livery of different teams. As we look down and we see Fabian Cantillara, it's hiatus time. Greg van Avermet, there he is in BMC's red and black. This is a fascinating one. Uh, Sebastian Lagerveld, by the way, was dead centre of that trio and somebody else who must not be discounted for Garmin Sharp. Definitely Sebastian Langeveld, uh, one of my favourites, 10th uh, in the Tour of Flams this year, obviously the winner in 2000. Sharp, too, specifically for these classics, but his Tour Hush of course, second in the De Paris-Roubaix. Is he now thinking in the autumn of his career that he can take the win? Because he sure has a mighty finish once he smashes that hammer down on the boards of the velodrome. But uh, Tom Boner on his wheel, Goliath Thomas in third place, nearly broadside around that particularly nasty bend, of course, this dust wreaking havoc, and it looks like Peter Sagan has nearly made the junction. Oh, do you know, he nearly got into the uh, motorcycle that had a nightmare going around that corner, and that's always a danger. Uh, they have to be there to relay the pictures so that you can actually see what's going on, but unfortunately, nearly became uh, part of the action in a bad way, and in fact, has just uh, been told to give a little bit of space to... I think, yes, don't get too close. They do kick up a lot of dust as well. It doesn't help the riders for them to be too close to get these rather arty um, close-up shots. Um, but, uh, yeah, it just makes me feel uncomfortable. It does. It's, it's a little bit dangerous, of course. It's, it's not unknown for motorbikes to come to grief. And, of course, the riders, of course, they do ride very closely, but they've got to give each other uh, space on those corners. You won't see the riders on the bends overlapping the wheels. If you get caught the wrong side, you're down too. So you need to ride just about half a length off. You can just... because it is very, very dangerous, but it does look like the junction is nearly being made. 11, nine seconds the gap now, as Geraint Thomas squeezes a gel, searching for those calories as we reach the denouement of the queen of the classics. Empty these nasal pastures there, probably absolutely full of dust. Debacker on his will, the young Belgian, running out of his skin today, not doing too much, obviously looking after the interest of his team leader. John Degen Colby, we believe, is in this pack, but there's some superstars in that group oh, there. It's absolute superstars. It's rack full of them. And whoever wins today, this might come down 
to a mighty bunch sprint in the velodrome. Can you imagine after all this? Remember, I don't know, that, that would be a, a, a spectacle, of course, but we've still got the notoriously difficult Carafar de Lab to come. And Tor knows it. Um, the, uh, there's uh, Sector 6 coming up. Uh, they're double counted as six for some strange reason. I think they're all around the same uh, the town of Bourgel, and maybe they do, maybe they do it twice. One. of this particular day and so you'll just forgive us um, they're supposed to be on pave right now and it doesn't quite look like it oh yes finally they are um, they're partially tarmac I think a coating Borgel de Wanahain it's a three star only 1.1 kilometers long but to Ulrich Green Edge you've been chasing for the last few kilometers Peter Sagan has finally made the junction with his Belkin uh, compatriot which was Martin Wyant but a very tenuous <laughs> Three point nine kilometers only, and uh, Debaka uh, getting a free ride at the moment because Bonin's got to do this. And look at the skirmishes going on here. This is amazing. Cancellara lights it up. Uh, Zep van Mark goes absolutely with him. Staying in touch is Greg van Avermet as well, and not that far away, Sebastian Lang Langeveld. This is fantastic. Uh, Taylor Finney's also still in the mix here. Do you see the remarkable acceleration of number one in the Trek Factory Racing kit, Fabian Cancellara? Of course, he has a Corinthian Gladiators helmet adorning oh, the head tube. The ditch has a crash bitten. on the corner. It has, and that's Van Avermaet who's in the ditch. Joining him is Michael Shah, the Swedish and Swiss champion as well. And they've got to pick themselves up, and they've got to do this very, very quickly. Also in the mix there is Steve Chanel, who's in a good position for AG2 Ola Mondial, and uh, Matthew Ledenio, who's in part of the original break, who's done well to hang on to this position so far. And look at the lime dust being uh, kicked up here, uh, limestone and. Uh, uh, chalk as well all over the place well chalk this one up is a fantastic move perhaps 23.2 kilometers to go and it's all line out at the moment and this is the reason why it is Tom Bonin what a vision uh, for to look at that for a picture what a freeze frame I think I'd happily stick that on my wall this is legendary stuff it's almost mythological but the Herculean work that Tom Bonin is putting in, has he done too much? I think he's panicking, he's taken a bottle and a gel attached to the top there, very good way of taking the feed. Oh God, take him a breath away, what a scene, but <laughs> Fabian Cancellara absolutely on the rivet has shut down this gap and split that group to absolute pieces and he's still on the front now with Sepp van Mark glued to his back wheel. Can't help it, he just has to go for it and uh, in a situation such as this then why not do exactly that? If you've got something left, it looked like Valhalla back there did it not? Well, I don't think it's going to be Tor's day, I, I believe he's put too much into this to be honest and uh, it looks like we're going to get a uh, call Falling together from a radio tour before you know it. Mind you, look at that. How do you call this together with so many gaps? It's been cast asunder by uh, yet another uh, little off. Thankfully, the likes of Greg van Avermet have remounted and it is bridgeable because there's a lot of talent there. And look, this is uh, Matt Lalagneau trying to get himself back into a decent position. The coolest man out there, I don't know whether it's just uh, drinking for psychology's sake, is Peter Sagan. <laughs> Takes a big swig like, yeah, I'm just slightly thirsty. Yeah, this is an absolutely crucial time to make sure you keep on uh, topping up. Some of the riders now might be reaching for what we traditionally call in road racing the finale flask and it's generally a high glucose or high caffeine based drink or gel to get into your legs in the last 10 or 15 kilometers. That can make a little bit of a, a bit of a difference, but it's uh, Belkin who was still driving this group. It looked like the junction was made. There's, a, there's a been a bit of a hesitation behind. Fabian Cancellara probably reluctant to carry such a big group across that gap. He wants to isolate and whittle this group down as much as he can, so there has been a bit of a hesitation. I've noticed Luke Rowe in there for Team Sky. It looks like uh, also Bradley Wiggins is still in there as well, as well as Bernard Eisel. 21.6 kilometers to go. Now, uh, the next uh, Pave sector is the Compas en Pave. And then, only three kilometers later, oh, look, he can't help himself. He wants to play with us today, and he's playing with absolutely everyone. Is he playing with fire? Sagan goes again. 
This is a great move uh, by Peter Sagan. A very, very interesting style and about a pugnacious, a punchy little rider. But what an acceleration that was. One of the finest sprinters in the world getting in a real good aero tuck, caked in dust. This is a picture. He looks behind, he's opened up a gap. He's going for it. Well, he's either going for it, he's going to be left out there to fry. We'll see how uh, they get on. And the likes of Greg Van Avermaet, who just gets back into this one, helped by Michael Schaar, I think was also caught up. It wasn't that he just uh, drifted back to help him. Maybe just uh, slammed on the brakes and decided to stay in touch should he be needed. And boy, oh boy, he is. Sagan is using every single advantage he can at the moment. Marriage neutral wheels for those who get caught out in the Carrefour de l'Arbre, one of the few vehicles that will be allowed to go through and into that zone. It's a five-star pavé section. It comes up at uh, 17 kilometres to go. Uh, there is one more still to come in 800 metres, and Sagan will hit it on his own first. This group has now come together. There's a, a little bit of discord, they're all looking at each other, who is going to take up the chase? And there's a counter-attack from one of the front du jour riders, but a very, very good move there. Sensing a little bit of disharmony, sometimes it's the ideal opportunity to go. Moves in the Paru Bay have gone on the cobbled sections, and of course, oh, Peter Sagan taking the opportunity on the tarmac, while there was a bit of a lull in the action to attack, and he's opened up a lovely lead, and now getting into as big of an aero tuck as he can. He's got Mavic neutral service behind, lots of spare wheels. What a job they do on this very, uh, very, very difficult and challenging uh, uh, circuit. But uh, Sagan now riding away from this elite group. You talk about challenges, he's set one out for himself here. He's almost bet against himself here. Um, you can hear the conversation with uh, good angel, bad angel, or angel and devil upon his, his shoulders, uh, chatting away to him. One thing he's got, though, is just undiluted self-belief in his own capabilities. And when it doesn't happen for him, when it's not going well, Sagan will just ease up. He's not doing that at all. He believes that this day could be his and it could be a first step. <laughs> Il n'y a plus d'image à l'RTBS, tu regardes. Bonjour, je suis à Jugel. Il ne faut pas qu'ils ont plus rien pour l'image. Ton enregistrement, il ne va pas aller alors Ils n'ont plus rien. Mais dans ce RTBS, tu revois à l'infini, là, tu vois le bout. Ouais, ouais. Dans ce RTBS, tu peux le retrouver demain. Même tu vois quoi Par là, ils sont arrangés. Nous, ça va. Les saucisses, ils vont plus. Mais alors, lui, il ne fait pas beaucoup de poussière non plus, alors. Heureusement que t'as niché un hélico à 2-3 ouais. mètres l'eau. Mais quoi là, mais ça, un mire bon pour ton coureur. Allez, viens. In this event, 20 kilometers to go. He's on to this short pavé section. Um, it's five from home. Uh, haven't got the branding on it as to uh, the difficulty levels, uh, but uh, in fact I have. It's four. It's a category four. This is supposed to hurt. It's only beaten in terms of uh, difficulty by three other sectors. One comes in almost immediately after. We've got 1,800 meters of this, and then at 17 kilometers to go, Mark, we have the nightmare of the Carrefour de l'Arbre, our last five-star test. We certainly we do, but at the moment Peter Sagan is where he wants to be. Sometimes the best place to ride these cobbles is so you can see your own line in front, but it's Belkin who are bringing it all back together. But look at Fabian Cancellara on the wheel of the danger man, Seth Van Mark, who's riding extremely strongly. Look at him just moving with ease and suplesse around the group, but Fabian Cancellara isn't giving him an inch. But Peter Sagan, this is a very technical section. There is a right-hand corner midway through as Lars Baum takes it up at the front now. Well, Baum is uh, working as uh, really the uh, super domestique on behalf of Seth Van Mark. Uh, it'd be great to have him up the road if Van Mark can bridge over to him and then finds himself in, a, in that select group. And how select will it be? If we have Baum, Van Mark uh, and Cancellara along with Sagan, if they manage to just uh, nip off the front here, that would be magnificent. And what a scenario we'd have with four gladiators is heading for the uh, for the velodrome and I wouldn't even be surprised if Lars Bohm turned the clock back to his track days. <laughs> Sagan, 
He said this is a very difficult uh, corner, a right-hander, and Baum went down the dust, did try to take the inside line where all the dust is, but now it's caused a bit of a split after the acceleration of his teammate, Sat Van Mark, who is now countered by Fabian Cancellara, looking at bringing back a flying Peter Sagan. The gap now, 15 seconds. It is. Look at the strength between these two. I think they might have to form some sort of an alliance. It may work. Uh, but uh, right now, at the moment, the jewel in the crown is this man. It's Sagan, and he's got the benefit of choosing which sector to go, and he's got no dust in his face either. There's a lot of traffic uh, behind him, he's, but directly behind is that neutral service bike, which is carrying the spare wheels for him, and he'll be oh so glad of that. 18.1 to go. Don't forget, he's got 1,100 metres before he's in the last of the categorised five sectors. And here it comes, uh, these guys are into Sector 5, the Campan and Purvey. He's heading for four, heading into Sector 4, the Class 5, and top of the class is Segal at the moment. Here come the chasers, and what quality they are. They've eaten into the... Ten seconds is all they've got, Matt. Yeah, Peter Sagani was, was riding very, very well, but noticeably slower over that Pavage section. There was a complete difference in style and actually a momentum when you looked at the speed and pace. Hey! 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 Fabian Cancellara, and indeed, they have shaved down the... the the, the lead of, uh, of Peter Sagan, of course, the Slovak champion, takes the gel. Probably is going to rest up now, let this group eat him up and sit on board and see where it goes from there. But it's a very brave move, a very tactically astute move by Peter Sagan to put himself in prime position. Yeah, very much so. And he, he's got to believe that he's got a chance against these guys. Steve Bar's there too. Oh, Zdenek is uh, part of the fun. And Dagan uh, Kolb. And not that far behind um, is, in fact, Bradley Wiggins. Hey, Mick! that. Winning of uh, Gent Vavelgem, of course, got a puncture on the Milan San Remo, an event that he thought perhaps he should have had. Uh, everyone thought that Sagan would be a major feature of that was not to be. Well, um, the top table gets very selective invites right now, clearly. It certainly does. John Dagan Cole from... Just taking that corner very nicely with Fabian Cancellara on his wheel. Interesting to see Zdenek Stibar, the World Cyclocross champion.
us. Might just go down here. surface it's not even a surface obviously Pete Sagan opting for the footpath on the right hand side but that's not safe because it's rutted it dips it throws you all over the place it's difficult to control the vibes what a bunny hop there by Seth Van Mark to leap across the, the border onto the path onto the wheel of Zdenek Stibar who in turn is on the wheel of reigning champion Fabian Cancellara this is amazing stuff it is absolutely and Dagan Cobb is here and he's got to be a massive danger to Sagan if he's got hopes of turning this one into a sprint and there is Sabrat uh, resplendent his beard like King Henry VIII at the moment. Can he get crowned today? I've no idea. We've got to stay with this and find out. 15.6 kilometres to go. Oh, it's huge this. Nobody said this was meant to be easy. It's meant to be difficult. That's the joy of it. The Belgian riders are back here from Giant Shimano. We've got Dagan Cole just up the road, but it's the flying Welshman, Geraint Thomas, eighth in, Par in the Tour of Flanders last week. He's trying to shut the gap down, but when it's it's the riders of the like of uh, Seth Van Mark making the pace, that's a very difficult proposition. But at the moment, Pete Sagan is holding He's holding them clear, but it looks like Van Mark is about to bring him to heel. He is, but Cancellara is in the frame. Steve uh, <laughs> also in the mix here. Steve denied last year. Don't forget the cyclocrosser. Uh, one of those that crashed very late on from a select group of four. Well, you want select. It doesn't get much more select than this with 15.1 to go. What talent we've got. And all of them riding in the dirt at the moment. This is one of the most difficult sections of the whole day. And as we see, Nicky Sturps for number 25 being distanced by the rampaging set van mark and fabian cancellara duo who are tearing this race to pieces it's at sixes and sevens at the moment the early animator tom boone and a I'm not too sure if it was well, Tyler we'll or not. Langveld is definitely there. So, so is Bradley Wiggins, Geraint Thomas, De Back is there. But this is the elite group of four. Cancellara, Van.
Difficult to say, but Tom Boonen in a world of hurt now, still riding very strongly, but did possibly do a little bit too much, but arguably lit this race up. Hit this race up. He's with the Terpstra, Wiggins and Thomas. What an absolutely fantastic quartet that is. Yep, it is as well. And if anything happens to those boys up front... Have a word with Sagan. Sagan wasn't even interested, just took a big slow swig. It looked like he was at a bar just ordering a bourbon. This man is cool as a cucumber, <laughs> and believe me, he could do something exceptionally cool in the few kilometers that we have left of this grace race. Just 13.3 to go. This is an incredible scenario that's playing out before us today. 13.2 seconds ago, the gap is 15 seconds. It is closable, but only if. They lose the momentum in front. They're looking at each other. If I was Fabian Cancellara, especially with the Carrefour de Lag behind me, I'd be very, very worried about Degenkolb, who's just been there or thereabouts, hovering on the wheels, never putting his nose in the wind. He's the danger. He took out Gent Vavelgem. He's arguably the fastest finisher in that select elite group out front now. Gap's gone out to 16 seconds. If this group works together, the power of Boonen, Terpstra, Geraint Thomas, and the Olympic time trial champion Bradley Wiggins, a Tour de France champion too, don't forget. What a fascinating finale. Yep, indeed, they've got the potential, but will they use it? Can they possibly get back at these guys who suddenly now are working together? This is like the uber team time trialing team on the planet you're looking at right now. And the only man who's really not interested is Peter Sagan. Well, fair play to Peter Sagan. I mean, he took the race by the struck with the neck. It was a very, very tactically astute and wise move. It was for his such move a, that led to this. For such a young man, he sensed a lull in the action, and that is when it was Tom Boone and himself last week at a at a press conference said that the race, the winning... his arm out nonchalantly and said you want to relay back on then you do that but you're not going to get help from me he says I don't know where the French accent came in there by the way fifteen seconds is what these guys have over Bonin Wiggins Thomas Oh my goodness, and in fact they've got more company now as well, and Langebelt is also uh, I I involved. 
So, and uh, who else as well? It's, uh, it's starting to rack up behind them. They have company and uh, they have problems as well because out front we have Cancellara, Set Van Mark, Zdenix. <laughs> Oh, we have Peter again, and they're starting to rock and roll across the road. If they play too much cat and mouse, they're going to blow this. The group behind are working very, very well together. I know Stybar isn't going to do too much work here. He's not going to look at that. He's sat on the wheel. Every time they do that, they're losing momentum and slowing down. But it's Dagan Cobb who senses a little bit of it. He needs to keep the pace high. The gap's 15 seconds. You've got some immense firepower behind, of course. Geraint Thomas and Bradley Wiggins are going to be riding themselves into the ground. Bradley Wiggins absolutely covets Paru Bay. For him to get himself on the podium, this could be the last chance in his career. He's going to be absolutely determined to try and bring this back together to give himself a chance. And there he is on the back in that lovely, smooth style of his on the wheel of Sebastian Langveld, riding very, very well, very well indeed himself. Top 10 last week in the Tour of Flanders. Himself a bit of a danger man. Boom! in there. corner almost in such an acute angle he almost caught himself on one of the metal bollards which uh, guard the uh, uh, the roadside here and just remind pedestrians that this is a danger point and to look either way well right now they're just looking straight up the road if they start looking at each other however they're going to neutralize themselves they only have 15 seconds over a very talented group however I think uh, the win will come from this selection here. Fabian Cancellara of Trek Factory Racing in the black and white. And it was writ large in black and white, was it not, at Flanders. He's done the double before, don't forget. Can he do it again? Set from Mark from Belkin in the green and black. It's the group that's further up the road from... Oh. <laughs> As we speak, Zenek Stebar there from Omega Pharma Quickstep as we hook back to them now. Peter Sagan at the back right now of this uh, uh, quintet, five talented riders. And just ahead of him is the black and white of uh, John Dagenkolb with those two stripes. It's going to be these guys, it has to be, because they're going to suddenly start worrying. It's only 16 seconds, I know. They're going to start running out of Pave as well to do some damage. The next one comes up with eight kilometers to go. In uh, 2,300 uh, meters time, they will be on it. And then I believe there's only one more, a very, very light section, almost a bus stop, I think, that they're going to go over before they get into the velodrome. Who's going to be most worried about hitting the velodrome as a group of five? That's well, the question. It is. It's going to be very, very, there's some very, very quick finishes. I would say, for my money, the quickest. <laughs> would be John Dagenkold, but it's a completely different proposition. You've ridden 51.1 kilometers of pave, 257 kilometers in some of the hardest conditions. This bike race is unique, it's like no other. So, the, the muscles are going to be tired, they're going to be dampened. You're not going to be the sharp, sprightly sprinter that you normally are in a bunch gallop that we see in the Grand Tour. Any one of these riders could win it. On paper, it's Degenkolb, but I'd imagine he's very, very tired. But he, he did take out Gent Vavelgem. He glances behind. 14 seconds now. This is a relentless pursuit, and you can see the foreshortened oh, gap there. They're coming. But it's Geraint Thomas and Bradley Wiggins driving this back. This is absolutely incredible. 11 seconds. They're nearly there. They'll be all together. They know this. Suddenly, somebody's going to launch. with it 
says Van Mark. I'm not going to relay through. You want this, you're going to have to reach out and grab it and take some of it yourself. Cancelo is on the front at the moment. Nine seconds it is. Sagan has a look. Sagan and uh, Dagan called to my money. have got most to lose here by hanging around. Are they going to reach out? Will they put in an acceleration? Well, the only opportunity now, for unless it's just a sneaky attack, is on this last section of Cobbles. Willems to him, it's scored 1.4 kilometres in length. They're going to be hitting that very soon. But the junction is made. It is. They're going to take them on board. They're going to make this count. Thomas is there. Wiggins is there. Uh, likewise, we have uh, uh, a number of other players, very much so. Tom Bonin also there. And Nicky Terpstra has made it through. So, will they drag this to the line? Look at the face of Bradley Wiggins. He's in a race winning position here driving this on the front he's got an amazing engine it's John Dagenkolb the German sprinter sat on his wheel Zdenek Stibar has made the junction set for Mark in fourth place but Bradley thinking we don't want to sit up at the end of this race look at the superstars there a grand tour winner as well absolutely spectacular as they head on to the penultimate section of Pave. well it's a lozenge shaped uh, velodrome that we have approaching but this is the knights of the round table you have here oh the quality that we've got and just 8.1 to go i can't believe it after such brutality throughout the entire day it's going to need somebody who's going to go for this and I think Seth Van Mark is going to be forced to do some work Cancellara is playing poker he's playing uh, 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 like a dead man at the moment but he's got so much power he can deliver it what you need in a situation such as this perhaps is a teammate and Dagan Kolb's got it this is what Dagan Kolb have got Dembaka with respect to Dembaka not one of the most famous riders in the peloton but a Belgian so he will have been And John Dagenkolb, arguably one of the quickest riders in this group, but again, you're looking at the, the calibre of Tom Boone and a green jersey winner in the Tour de France. Peter Sagan, one of the fastest finishers in the world. This is an amazing mix. And then you've got guys that can go along like Bradley Wiggins and, of course, Olympic pursuit, uh, team pursuit champion Geraint Thomas from Wales, just getting distance off the back there. But, of course, is he tired? Is he not? Is he just bluffing? But what a, what a select group. I don't think I've seen such a large select group come to the finish together. And there we have... Roubaix. We do. It's our destination. The velodrome that started off this great event back in 1896 when uh, two uh, businessmen built it and then decided to have a race to it and it's been enthralling as ever since the original roads became better and then they searched for the pavé right now they search for anywhere but pavé and you can see they've given themselves a little bit of a flat zone to work on uh, with only seven kilometers to go they've got a 22 second gap now over the pursuers and now we at least know from where our winner is going to come this question remains, who will it be? And at the moment, uh, literally, the sacrificial lion is Burke de Bakker riding absolutely out of his skin on his uh, giant Defy advanced SL bike, absolutely driving it into the ground. He knows his teammate, John Dagenkolb, already, already taken out. Again, Weber game this year has a big chance, but the rest of these guys, absolutely class. Sebastian Langford, their number 86 in the Garmin Sharp astride, is rather signy Cervelo and Bradley Wiggins. The Tour de France champion, could he make history today? But again, De Bakker is definitely the sacrificial lamb, trying to keep this pace as high as possible for Dagenkolb. Oh. Right, gather yourselves, because this is going to be explosive. We now have a uh, flat er section, and in fact, we only have one more piece of pavé to go. It is virtually inconsequential. It's 300 metres, it's very new pavé, it is not Napoleonic, 
that one of these guys is going to be crowned. Lombardi, donc une opportunité pour lui. Les critiques en amont de la course disaient effectivement Sagan risque de caler un petit peu 257 km. C'est peut-être un petit peu au-delà de ce qu'on peut attendre d'un Sagan. Mais à le voir œuvrer de la sorte, on se dit quand même que eh ben, tous les indicateurs sont, sont au vert pour l'instant. Voilà. Et on sait, si Terstra est un poursuiteur, il y a quand même 250 km dans les jambes. Et Terstra arc bouté la sacrifie les Higgins. I, frankly, I don't think so, but he's done some amazing things, and we've got an attack, and it's rolling into them. Oh, and going for it is Nicky Tapstra. He's decided that uh, this fun is is not over. This is an absolutely sub superb move by Nicky Terpstra. Obviously, absolutely flying at the moment. Uh, the former Dutch road race champion has taken the opportunity with a bit of a lull in the action. Nobody willing to take the pace. It's poor Bert de Bakker from Giant Shimano, the only one willing to take it up. Ah. Oh, Geraint Thomas and Bradley Wiggins spent forces here. They've well, had a bit of a chat with each other. What do they do? Set Vermont looks across to the Tour de France champion. He's looking at them. Who's going to chase and again? It's De Bakker on the front for Oh, oh my God! 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 Dagen Kolb, oh, Nicky Terpstra nearly <laughs> came to grief, but it's all or nothing now for Terpstra, who's had a fantastic season so far. He has, he uh, was disappointed in Flanders um, with his performance there. He was third here, don't forget, led on the bunch after uh, Van Mark and Cancellara went into the velodrome alone, determined not to uh, fall to uh, fatigue or indeed in the greatness of all of those around him. And they're looking at each other and they can't afford to do this. Maybe they're a spent force, I do not know. And Cancellara does what he did in Flanders, pulls out a gel and pretends to take a whole load and hopes that that message gets relayed back. Oh, Geraint Thomas takes a dig on the left-hand side uh, to counter a move. One after to the, the other, other, they're going for it. They can't help themselves. 5.4 kilometers to go, 10 seconds is the gap. Well, Dagan Cobb couldn't go with Nicky Terpster, he's up the road. Ah, oh, 5.4, 11 seconds is what he's got. That is a country mile in the situation such as this with 5.3 to go. Now, Nicky Terpstra is a man who does a lot of work during the winter time. He's a six day race specialist. He doesn't mind the track at all. He loves a bit of endurance. He uh, is a partner of Ilya Kaiser, who's not part of this break right now, but very much so is Nicky Terpstra. <laughs> Eight seconds he's got. Can he deliver? At Nicky Serbs are absolutely on the rivet, obviously. Twice take taken out Dwarz Dor Van Vlaren, so he's absolutely at home on the cobbles. But what a move. Eight seconds only. It's now a pursuit. Who is going to take up the chase? It looks like Fabian Cancellara has gone to the front a little bit, but there's a little bit of discord. There's no real relaying. Look at the face of Terpstra. He knows he is 4.2 kilometers away from writing himself into the pantheon of the greats of the sport because Paris-Roubaix is simply so special. It was eight seconds. It's now 13 because they haven't been able to match the pace of the man who can time trial like a demon, a man who knows the boards. He knows how to act in a situation such as this and he knows that the velodrome is beckoning and it's 3.9 kilometers and it's 14 seconds now Terps has wrapped this one up Terps are, oh, it, uh, let's just hope he doesn't have a look at the study of concentration his legs are going to be burning but he knows it's possible he knows it's 14 seconds and there doesn't seem to be any 
cohesion in the chasing group. Bradley Wiggins grim grimacing, Fabian Cancellara looking nonchalant, if anything. But look at the face as Terpstra gulps in the air to those lungs. He, his legs are going to be burning with pain, searing, almost on fire. As soon as he hits the velodrome, if he is alone, that pain will dissipate. He will just be full of endomorphin euphoria. And look at him go at the moment. He has to do this on his own. He's got no choice now. This is his role. And he is standing up and taking it to perfection. Sagan hasn't got a response. It looks like these guys have just burnt themselves in their counter-attacks. One rolling into the other. And right now, one man has rolled off the front. 15 seconds, he's pulling out a gap. 3.4 to go. I think Nicky Terstra is riding to victory. And it's Geraint Thomas who takes it up at the front. And it's Debaka who's hardly missed a beat on the front, riding for Dagen Kolb. But there is a study of concentration. I tell you what, I would love to... <laughs> Safety is going for. by their own standards, but are they about to take out a monument? Could Nicky Terpstra engrave his name onto that cobble? I think he will. And with uh, just over three kilometres to go for Terpstra, these guys are 17 seconds adrift now. And they're thinking about racing for second place, putting something back into the legs. They know they haven't got what it takes to get up to this man. And Nicky Terpstra has just rode away with this. It's nearly 20 seconds. He's, uh, he's gapping them even further. He's absolutely in the zone. And now this is when euphoria takes over. He will absolutely be running on on sheer adrenaline as the crowd urges him on this isn't an ordinary bike race this is the stuff of legend this will live for him for the rest of his life he will never forget this moment and it could be a moment to save it he could enter that velodrome on his own it's gone out to 18 seconds now with only 2.6 kilometers to go we're looking at the reigning champion what has he got in the tank because the tarmac is running out it is and that's all we have left apart from a uh, very very gentle piece of modern pavé flat surfaced and this man is flat out at the moment holding 19 seconds Nicky Terpstra it's a man who works hard during the winter he doesn't allow himself any downtime at all he does a whole load of six day racing he did the six days of Amsterdam it, 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 he has won that in the past Rotterdam as well he knows how to carry form people say that's a strange thing to do you've got to let your body time give your body time to recover well he doesn't he just uh, he just changes the pace with which he engages cycling as his profession and with two kilometers to go less than that now he is going to deliver a massive victory as part of his palmares he will enter the crate 20 seconds ah this can't even fault gaan be so well won. A study of concentration at his chamber, they're riding a 53 times 46 chamber. He glances over this 20 seconds. There's a lot of road between him and the chasing group. Definite discord. This is the final section of almost superfluous pave. You can almost savour it. His legs are going to be hurting, but he's at the point now he's going to be enjoying the pain that's coursing through his veins, through his muscles. He could become one of the greats. What an absolute <laughs> fantastic opportunity for this young man. He's going to enter the velodrome on his own, just about to go under the flamme rouge. Nicky Terpstra writes himself into the history books. He does. He makes the turn. The velodrome doth beckon. As soon as he makes the turn in, into it he will be directly opposite the finish line he has to take half of the track and cross the finish line not once but twice first time by he'll hear the bell it won't be a race it'll be a parade he'll sit up arms aloft Conti.
select group of riders to take the velodrome alone. Looks behind just to make sure he won't ease off on the pedals. Bike riders very rarely do. He's going to savour this moment, the sweetness of it all. Beautiful riding. Here we go then, the race is not over. We have our winner, but who is going to be runner up? They play cat and mouse. We uh, look for Sagan, he's not here. It's about these guys, he's round the other side of the track right now. And in fact, they've just been rung in. I think they picked up the wrong group here. They have picked up the wrong, this is the group behind the, the Wiggins group. And hopefully we won't miss the Wiggins group come into the line. But uh, this is definitely the chasing group with uh, Bernie Eisel in it. <laughs> there, there, there we are. Uh, we pick it up. I think we may have got it right right now. And uh, coming up and over the top, it is... <laughs> Well, I think we've actually picked up the other group. I, I, I beg your pardon uh, on behalf of our, uh, our broadcasters here. But it is the race for the line, and uh, they take uh, one of it anyway. Uh, but there you go. Slight confusion at the end, but we know who is our winner. And it is uh, over the other side of the track. Uh, yeah, no wonder they pulled away from that, but there you go. Uh, so minor places that were up for grabs. Unfortunately, we missed the crossing of the line because we weren't provided with those pictures. <laughs> but there you go. <laughs> Tor comes in to uh, add his name to a long list of talent out there um, but believe me one name rings high above all else and it's Nicky Terpstra um, don't blame Eurosport by the way uh, the pictures are provided by our host broadcasters but they got the winner no doubt about that and here he is Nicky Terpstra what a performance what an absolutely fantastic ride by Nicky Terpstra there he let out a cry the spittle coming off his mouth jersey slightly unzipped caked in dust what a moment for a, at a man at the absolute peak of his powers already taken out the Tour of Qatar this year of course Duard Dors van Bladeren an absolute workhorse for Amiga Farmer Quickstep savoring that moment as we see Fabian Cancellara riding away a little bit disconsolate but of course he's already run this way three times but for Amiga Farmer Quickstep and this young man who is in tears now and I must admit Carlton I was near here is the sprint that was <laughs> that we missed um, uh, but uh, Dagan Golf taking it ahead of a uh, Fabian Cancellara I think he may well have got on the podium uh, again we'll wait for the official confirmation of the congratulations your first victory here, a very tactical uh, teamwork. Uh, for sure, it's uh, one of the most wonderful day of your life. Well, of my career, it's it's the best day. Uh, I had some nice results, especially this year, and then to to take the win and. The base, biggest classic of all, it's, well, it's dream come true. Third last year, so we can say that you what? deserve this victory. Sorry? You were third yeah, last year, so yeah. you, you can say that you deserve this victory. Uh, yeah, it's a race that suits me well. I've been in front uh, a lot there. But uh, yeah, my shape this year was really good, so I was motivated for, uh, for a good result over here. Uh, the team was good in the end, so we had some riders to play with, and I attacked, and it was a good attack. Thank you very much, congratulations. <laughs> Après avoir pédalé durant plus de 50 km sur les secteurs pavés, il est donc reçoit le pavé du vainqueur. Et maintenant, nous saluons également donc autour du, du podium et des trois lauréats Daniel Perry. Oh, Elbow. Oops. 
the boo boo there.